Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Jeb Fields and I'm a commercial horticulture specialist with the LSU Ag Center, the Hammond Research Station. And today I'm gonna to be serving as the moderator for this virtual citrus symposium. We're gonna have a bit of a different feel to our symposiums than normal as it's virtual. We're trying some things out today. So we hope that you just pair with us. Uh, we will have some wonderful live talks, uh, webinars, some really informative information. We also have some pre-recorded videos and tours for you, so we hope you really enjoy it. I would like to introduce Anna Timmerman, Joe Willis, and Chris Dunaway, our Greater New Orleans Extension Area Agents, uh, who are the hosts for today's symposium. Just so you know, on the right hand side of your chat, there's a question of your screen. There's a chat box with a question mark. There is no uh, audio communication between you um, and uh, the presenters. So if you have any questions or any thoughts or concerns or anything you would like to know more about, please at any time just send us a message, post your question in the chat box and we'll do our best to get it answered in a timely fashion. Without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Ann Timmerman and get this symposium started. <laughs> okay, well, welcome everybody to the 2021 virtual symposium. Um, I know we would all prefer to meet in person and, and be eating coffee and donuts right now and Wayne's jambalaya for lunch, but we uh, really have to do it this way because of the COVID restrictions. Um, but next year should be pretty exciting. Um, as you will see later in the program today, we have a brand new research facility coming online that's going to support a lot of good citrus work for the state of Louisiana. Um, I'm just really excited about the future of citrus research for the state. I know it's been a while since we were able to do anything through the LSU Ag Center in that field, um, but we are now set up to kind of leap into the future full blast. Uh, 2020 and 2021 did see a lot of challenges, not only for the Ag Center, but for producers across the state with the various hurricanes, uh, COVID restrictions, loss of markets, and this most recent freeze event. Um, we are hearing reports of a lot of lost trees throughout the state, particularly in the west part of the state. Um, we hope the Ag Center can help, uh, especially moving forward with some new stuff, some new research and some new resources that we're going to discuss today with some of our speakers. This presentation, this whole day is being recorded and all the recordings and handouts will be available to you next week. We're hoping to get them on the Ag Center website. They will definitely be on the Hammond Research Center's website and on that louisianacitrus.org website as well under the commercial producers tab. Be sure that you're checking that tab pretty frequently. We do post LDAF updates and any new information regarding quarantines, um, any new research or materials that we find interesting, and you can kind of keep tabs on what we're up to um, in regards to citrus production, citrus research in the state. So that's a good resource um, that I want to make sure you all know about. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Joe Willis. Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad you're able to attend. We hope that you find that your time investment uh, is really fruitful for you today. I want to let you know that uh, the symposium is geared more to uh, professional growers but the Ag Center is interested in helping everyone, uh, as you can see there, <laughs> make your gardening endeavors more fruitful. And with that, I'd like to uh, announce that we uh, are going to be producing a series of courses. Uh, these are online courses that are going to be free uh, for anyone to attend, but we will have registration and it's the Backyard Orchard. And uh, with that, okay, Jeb, and the first class uh, course that we're going to be doing is on citrus. Um, citrus is probably the number one backyard orchard tree grown and probably in the in Louisiana. I know in the southern part of Louisiana, but um, definitely in um, th that part. And so as you can see the citrus course, it's going to be broken up primarily into like five major categories. You can see there we're going to talk about the citrus types, the citrus varieties, uh, 
planting your citrus tree, annual maintenance. With annual maintenance, we're going to be including pruning and irrigation and fertilization and all those things. Uh, then we're going to go through some of the common problems you might run into, arthropods, which would include insects, mites, and all those guys, the common diseases and common abiotic disorders. And this will be uh, geared primarily to the homeowner and we will uh, launch this course on March 8th and it's going to be on fit. We'll announce it on Facebook, on the LSU Ag Center website and various other area, uh, areas. But if you have any friends who have citrus in their backyard and are interested, uh, let them know this course is going to be there for them. And to register, as you can see down there at the bottom, we've got a, a shortened uh, registration, uh, just tinyurl.com slash citrus course. Uh, if you go there, uh, you can register for the course and then uh, all registrants will be sent announcements when the course goes live as well. So thanks for attending. I want to welcome all of you to the 2021 um, Citrus Symposium from the Dockville Farm in Moreau, Louisiana. We're doing this virtually. Unfortunately, we are because of the pandemic is going on and we want to do everything we can to protect the health and safety of our clients as well as uh, the people who work for the LSU Agricultural Center. So bear with us. Maybe next time we do this, we can do it in person. You have an opportunity to tour the Louisiana Citrus Center for Excellence at the Dockville Farm. Uh, it is called FUSE, which is Fruit Under Screened Environments. We've got to find new ways to grow citrus in Louisiana uh, because of the climate we work in. The center will move uh, the research and activities of the Agricultural Center forward. Uh, there's some things in citrus we have to deal with. One is citrus canker and sassumas, uh, which is a major issue. We've also got to deal with growing citrus in containers as people are requesting to have uh, citrus in their backyards on their patios. And we have a hurricane environment in Louisiana. We've got to we'll deal with the citrus industry in that particular environment. And so these are the types of things we'll be starting on and hopefully make a really good uh, uh, impact on citrus. And we hope that you get a lot of information you can use uh, for your own citrus production uh, back home. I want to thank the Arlene and Joseph Moreau Charitable Foundation uh, who constructed this facility and the Moreau Foundation. I've put up $320,000 to establish professorships for us to use and with faculty doing research in horticulture and in the citrus industry. It will go a long way toward um, meeting the objectives of this particular uh, activity going on. I want to thank Rita Gu and Chris and Bill Haynes uh, for the work they're doing in this particular area and to our wonderful horticulture team that's worked as partners with them to make this all come to reality. It is truly a public-private partnership that's working great. The activities, the research, the information produced in this research effort will go a long way for helping our commercial citrus growers as well as our residential growers in years and years to come. Thank you so much for your attendance today and participating, and we look forward to seeing you at Dockville sometime soon. Hello, I'm Dr. Mike Selassie, Program Leader for Plant and Animal Sciences with the LSU Ag Center, and I'd like to welcome you to this 2021 Virtual Citrus Symposium. We've got a good program agenda today of presentations that we hope you'll find interesting and informative. We're especially excited for you to see the new research facility at the Dogville Farm. This is going to greatly expand our potential to do citrus research, and we certainly want to thank the Moreau Foundation for their generous support. Citrus production is an important sector of Louisiana agriculture, and the LSU Ag Center's mission is to do research and extension that addresses the needs of the citrus industry in the state. We are always welcome to input from the industry to help guide our research and extension activities. We want to thank you for your interest and participation in this event today. We want to thank you for your support of the citrus research and extension work that we do in the Ag Center, as well as for all of the research and extension activities the Ag Center conducts across the state. Well, that was great. I want to thank you all again for attending. We're going to get started very shortly with the uh, content, but I do want to re reiterate what Dr. Selassie said, that we are here to support the industry and the public of Louisiana 
in your efforts. So please always feel free to reach out to myself, to your local county agents uh, with any issues or problems you have or information you might want us to know. Uh, we're here to help you out. We are going to first get started with our virtual tour. And so we put a little video together of the new FUSE facility and some ideas about some of the research we're going to be uh, conducting in that facility. So before we get into the talks, I hope you enjoy this video. Good morning. My name is Jeb Fields and I'm an extension specialist with the LSU Ag Center Hammond Research Station. Today I'm at Dockville Farms and we're going to show you the new FUSE research facility. FUSE is fruit under screened enclosures and we're really excited about this. So the structure is a uh, high-tech screen house, uh, roughly one quarter of an acre in size. And this screen is 50 mesh to keep all pests out uh, for clean growing. So we'd hoped to give you a tour of this facility at the Citrus Symposium, but unfortunately we had to go virtual this year. So in lieu of that, we're gonna give you a virtual tour and our virtual ribbon cutting. So let's talk a little bit more about this facility, the partnership, and Citrus Research at uh, LSU Ag Center. So I'm now standing in what is referred to as the ante room. And so the ante room is just a method to keep this facility a little more sterile and pest free. When you first walk in, you see all the fans pointed directly out. Now, this room is currently under construction, so there'll be a big door behind me. But when you open up the door, walk in, these fans will turn on and blow any extra pests, any debris off you outside of the facility. And then we are building misters with a misting solution that will also help combat pests. So when you walk in, the fans will be blowing everything out. The mist will come on. You'll get covered in mist. You'll step in a little uh, solution to get the bottom of your feet. And then you can go and open this door, go into this room in a clean environment. So this is the primary, the primary research area within the facility. You see it's quite empty right now with a lot of fans. Uh, this facility was really built and established to support uh, St. Bernard Parish, local agriculture, and the Louisiana citrus industry. We feel that as we move forward, we're gonna need more sustainable opportunities for agriculture. And container production inside of screen houses gives us a really neat opportunity to become quite sustainable with our production practices. So what I mentioned earlier was this house was screened, so you can actually see right through it. This is a 50 mesh screen which is small enough to keep all pests out, but also allow air transfer throughout. So you get a little more cooling in the summer, a little more warm in the winters, because this is creating a microclimate, uh, but it's not completely changed, stopping humidity, air, and such from transferring in and out. So right now what you see is just, it's empty rocks. Uh, and we are slowly in development, so we're starting to build our irrigation systems for some different research, and that should be done by the time of this uh, symposium. So next year when you come out here we'll be happy to show you we'll have over five six hundred different trees in this facility alone all doing different research projects. So while this is a long-term research facility we have a few projects that we're going to be planning on right away. So first of all one of the things we want to do is look for plant citrus that is viable for container production. Now obviously our containers are relatively small and our citrus trees get pretty large. So we really need to look for dwarfing rootstocks that do well for containers. And so we're gonna look at a rootstock evaluation right from the beginning to kind of to find which do the best in containers, which will allow us for production in containers. Another immediate research area is if the container fruit is going to work, which we do believe it will, we need to understand the best practices or how to grow them best. So we're developing an area where we could try different substrate media, different water scheduling, different spray stake and water delivery methods, different sprinklers, different nutrient solutions for fertigation versus long-term fertilizer. So we're going to be testing all different production cultural practices in this area right here in a really high-tech multi-zoned uh, facility. That's going to make one of our more inclusive research projects that we're really excited about. Another use of this facility is to serve as a long-term germplasm repository. We want to make sure that we can support the industry, the Louisiana industry in particular. And in case of a disaster, any problematic, we want to make sure that we have viable trees with budwood available for our industry uh, of all the major variety, citrus varieties in Louisiana. So our goal is to serve not only research, to develop best management practices, to develop new 
uh, sustainable methods of production, but also to support the industry by always having availability of materials when needed. Hi everyone, I'm Anna Timmerman and I'm one of the free horticulture agents for the greater New Orleans area. And this is actually going to be the home of my master's project and my thesis. I'm excited to be partnered with the Miro Foundation and housing my trees here at this facility. This whole half will be dedicated to Satsuma research and we're going to start out with an initial uh, planting of 300 trees the first week of March. There's been some good research at the University of Florida about growing citrus in containers for the fresh fruit market. Most of the research has been done on grapefruits, which do struggle with citrus canker and greening challenges. Here in Louisiana, most of our fresh fruit market share goes to Satsumas, so that's what we've chosen to focus on. We do think that it could be economical to produce Satsumas for fresh fruit in containers at a high density so that the yield actually goes up compared to trees planted in the orchard at traditional planting densities. So it might be a more economical way of growing fresh fruit, a better piece of fruit, a better tasting piece of fruit without the pest and disease pressures of a traditional orchard. So while the primary function of this facility is to support the citrus industry of Louisiana and support citrus research and education, it's also here to support urban agriculture and agriculture across the state of Louisiana and here in St. Bernard Parish. The reason we called it FUSE, which is fruit under screened enclosures and not citrus under screened enclosures, is long-term plans we have to develop other fruit inside this facility. While citrus is leading the path, we're also going to eventually look at different uh, blueberries, different tree fruit crops, different intercropping systems within the greenhouse, and the whole world uh, that's open to us by growing within the containers in these screened enclosures. Well, we're really excited about the FUSE facility and the upcoming research that we have going in. We hope you are too. Uh, we want to remind you by next year, uh, this research will be up and running. Obviously, it should be up and running here in the next month or so as we move out of these cold weather. So we can't wait to show you in live, in person, uh, a visit to that facility for the next Citrus Symposium. I'm going to now play a quick update from the LDAF. Hi, I'm Tina Pache, the Director of the Horticulture and Quarantine Programs with the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry. I um, just want to provide you a few updates from our department today. Um, in October of 2020, the Louisiana Citrus Nursery Growers in Plaquemines Parish were in, impacted by Hurricane Zeta, causing catastrophic damage um, with at least three of our certified interstate producers. Um, on November 25th, USDA issued emergency action notifications to all three of the citrus nursery stock producers on the, their breached greenhouses. Um, the EN prohibits the movement of the citrus plants from outside of the citrus canker and citrus greening quarantined areas. So it limits the areas where their citrus nursery stock is being sowed. Um, in December of 2020, citrus canker was discovered on the Satsuma tree in St. Martin Parish. This is the first positive find in the parish. Uh, in January of 2021, um, a one-mile delimit delimiting survey was completed around the positive fine. Um, four USDA and two LDF inspectors were involved in this survey. A total of 34 citrus trees were inspected, with one sample being taken from a sour orange tree. The sample was reported negative for citrus canker. Um, we we're planning on extending out that delimiting survey further to see if this is just an isolated incident or if citrus canker has spread in that area. In 2020, we completed a citrus commodity survey. Um, we performed 96 inspections and 61 samples were sent to LSU, mainly from our New Orleans district. Um, 36 were diagnosed with citrus canker and 20 being diagnosed with citrus greening. All positive samples were collected within the current quarantine areas. Um, in April of 2021, we will begin this year's uh, citrus commodity survey and we'll be inspecting for 10 different citrus pests this year. Um, 
LDF continues to handle calls and emails from homeowners regarding citrus diseases. If a citrus tree shows symptoms of um, citrus greening, whether it's inside or outside of the quarantine area, or citrus canker outside of the quarantine area, a sample is taken and submitted to LSU for testing. All the positive citrus greening trees are placed on our removal list. Once um, we have consent forms from the homeowners, then we will remove, we are removing those trees. Um, if any time y'all have questions concerning any of this information or any, any citrus related issues, uh, please call our office. Uh, the number is 225-952-8100. Thank you and have a good day. Okay. Well, that was all some really good information. Uh, it's definitely a good phone number to know and to make sure you have handy in case you need any help. Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first speaker today. Our first speaker is Chris Oswald from the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Chris is a commercial citrus extension agent for Polk and Hillsborough counties. He has worked with the University of Florida as a citrus agent for nearly 25 years. In addition, he has spent 10 years as a citrus production manager for a commercial citrus operation in Florida. Chris, whenever you're ready. Okay, good morning. Can you all see the screen? We can. All right, excellent. Well, good morning, and it is such a pleasure to be invited to the LSU 2021 Citrus Symposium. And what I really want to do is share with you all today is a presentation on the development of a citrus artificial intelligence or AI app to diagnose nutritional deficiencies, diseases, and some pests in the field. First and foremost, I'd like to go ahead and thank Dr. Arnold Schumann, professor at the University of Florida's Citrus Research and Education Center for him and his lab doing all the research and development of this, of this particular app and the information that we're going to talk about today. Also like to give Dr. Schumann credit for the presentation. He allowed me to use parts of his presentation, the majority of it, from a talk that he did back with us for a grower OJ break we did back in January of this year. So I want to make sure that I acknowledge Dr. Schumann and his lab for all the help that I've gotten in being able to put this together for you all today. Well, the objectives of what we want to talk about today are as follows. We're going to look at using leaf symptoms as a tool for diagnosing, diagnosing excuse me, nutrient deficiencies, diseases, and pest management, and why is that important. I'm going to do a brief introduction to artificial neural networks and their potential use in agriculture. I'm going to talk about the development, the actual research of a smartphone app for diagnosing leaf symptoms, symptoms using AI or with AI. We're going to do an introduction into the actual Citrus Diagnosis web app, and we're going to also discuss a little bit about using this information to make some management decisions, which ultimately, as an extension person, the research that is generated, we need to extend this to you, the growers, so that you can make better decisions, management decisions, and that's how this whole kind of idea of extension research works. So I'm going to extend this to you all in Louisiana. So diagnostics, well, why is that important? Well, they can indicate the presence or absence of specific diseases, nutritional deficiencies, determine if there's specific economically damaging pest levels that need to be controlled. There are also many uh, times that you can find distinct patterns associated with herbicide uptake in the in the foliage of leaves, which is important in diagnosing those types of things. There's things like salt damage that also occur, whether that be spray damage or by uptake and sunburn on some varieties of fruit that are exposed to sunlight on the exterior canopy of trees. So these are all things that tell us something about the condition of a plant and its diagnostic. Many times these symptoms are very similar, yet can be the cause of different issues. Today, determining the 
correct diagnosis usually requires many years of field experience. And take, for example, the photo that you see here in this presentation. Now, as an, ex as an expert with lots of experience, I would look at those leaves and I, said I, would, I would put that in a class of categories. Is that nitrogen deficiency? Is it phytophthora? Or could it be girdling of that particular stem? Well, based on my experience, diagnostically, I would think without knowing anything else but this picture that that would be girdling. And the way and the reason why I would say that is that that appears on the new foliage. Typically, nitrogen moves out of old foliage to new foliage, so you would expect it not to show up so much in the new foliage because it'd be moving in. If you look in the foreground or the background, excuse me, of that picture, you'll notice that the leaves are green on the balance of the tree. So that leads me to believe that it's probably not Phytophthora because typically that disease progression is such that by the time you see the venal chlorosis, it's, it's over the entire tree. So that's what this diagnostic thing can help us do. And that's where I think this app is going to come in and help a lot is discerning some of these differences. And with, uh, again, demonstrating the subtle differences and symptoms can oftentimes mean an entirely different type of corrective action, varying symptoms that are specific to diagnosis, as the slide says. If a disease exhibits a pattern similar to a nutritional deficiency, typically you don't want to go out and spray manganese for iron deficiency, or you don't want to spray for iron or manganese for something like um, a greasy spot infestation where you have a distinct pattern on the leaf, but you're not sure what it is. You don't want to go out and treat the wrong symptom based on not correctly diagnosing the situation at the time. As in Florida, the diagnostic, the correct identification of nutritional deficiencies is critical when associated with an endemic HLB environment. So we have HLB, it's nearly everywhere. Well, it is everywhere, probably close to 100% infection. And with that infection, there comes some nutritional deficiencies that typically show up associated with that disease. And it's important because some of the research that we've seen, these minor elements that are deficient can oftentimes be beneficial if applied correctly. And a key to this is the correct identification of those deficiencies that allow us to choose the appropriate type of fertilizer to go in and treat these trees to try to improve the condition of the disease. And disease and pest symptoms on citrus leaves can also cause chlorotic patterns that's can, that can sometimes be mistaken for nutritional deficiencies, probably more so with something like greasy spot, maybe something like spider mites and HLB. If you look at those two, uh, leaves together there, the spider mites and the HLB. That blotchy model kind of pattern that's not um, symmetrical from one side of the leaf to the other um, can sometimes, if you're inexperienced, be confusing. And with greasy spot, you can have some of that spotting too and that yellowing on the upper surface of the leaf rather than the bottom. And sometimes even you can mistake greasy spot, initial greasy spot infection for maybe the initial infections with citrus canker. So these are some of the things the diagnostics can do that if they're done correctly can help us determine exactly what the course of action may be. So now that we talked about the importance of this in relation to production, let's switch gears a little bit and then we'll talk about what has happened with these artificial neural networks. And artificial intelligence, and as we have developed here recently, these deep learning models can help because they're fast and very accurate, especially these deep learning ones. And in research that has been done before with object identification, and this is some of the work that has come out of Dr. Schumann's lab, as you can look at this little slide here, hopefully you can see at least some of it. But in the different slide plates I have here, you can see where blooms have been identified. The next one, leaf flush has been identified, off bloom, split fruit, sunburn, even psyllids have been identified and also citrus canker, but these are looking at identifying objects. So we want to move that a little further because what we want to do is be able to discern the difference. We're just not looking for a specific object. We're looking at more of a condition of symptoms. So that takes a little bit more knowledge. And that's where these artificial neural networks and the deep learning 
deep convolutional artificial neural networks really started to take off in say like 2012 because we started to understand these better we could build these layers the computer power and the hardware that goes along with being able to do this fast and efficiently has come a long way since there since that time and they're excellent they have excellent accuracy in image recognition and the same technology is used for face recognition it's used for image search engines on the web and even self-driving cars so we wouldn't have thought of this kind of stuff 20 years ago but today it's becoming more and more commonplace and we hear these things so that's with the advent of this deep learning kind of concept so what does that i guess visually look like if you were to have a drawing of it initially some of the simple neural networks would just have what they would call shallow or they would just have one hidden layer so you would have an input layer of what you put into the model and then the network would look at that in this hidden layer and then it would come out with an output with the advent of these deep learning artificial neural nets you get the input layer and then you begin to see where you have hidden layers multiple hidden layers that better and with each subsequent layer looks at this aspect so that you get this a wide range of some in this case symptoms that can be looked at rather quickly and give you a very accurate output at the end of it because you're looking at more layers through this um, artificial neural network and some of the stuff that's been done out of dr schumann's lab again at least from the some of the practical aspects of it and object detection this one is automated object detection of in this case citrus canker as it goes by the tree it can pick out the lesions of citrus canker this is one that he worked with some colleagues at the gulf coast research and education center in Baum, florida and in this case it's mulch plastic and what they're identifying in a herbicide demonstration or, or research is they are identifying nut sedge coming out of mulch plastic and this technology identifies where the herbicide typically or where develop the technology and then you would only spray the nut such so you wouldn't sp spray and waste spray on the bare plastic is the idea of why this object object detection is important there was also some work that he did with blueberry growers up in canada and one of their concerns is blueberries are non-climacteric fruit so they don't ripen once they're harvested so they need to be picked at the right quality and quality is related to color in blueberries so this detects the blueberries that are ripe so that when it you know you would take this technology through the field you're determining when to pick because nothing's going to be ripe all at the same time but you want to choose a time when most of the berries are going to be ripe and this can help do that kind of do that well will help with that situation determining the timing this is also another one that was done in Baum at the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center, and it's looking at strawberries on mulch plastic, and it identifies Carolina geranium that has come up through the plastic, and it's it's identified it separate from the strawberry plants. So then that's another um, benefit or another use of this automated object detection. So now we talked a little about, about the neural nets and why it's important to get diagnostics right now we're going to actually go into the science behind development of this smartphone app and this was a master's of science program done by um, percy and dr schumann's lab mongofa and the hypothesis was that there would be an ai artificial intelligence machine vision diagnostic system may outperform the diagnose, diagnosis done by novice and expert scouts. So that was kind of the premise from which this project was based. And the objectives of the research product was to train a deep convolutional artificial neural network to recognize nutrient deficiencies, pests, and diseases on citrus leaves. Then to validate the performance of the trained network to identify symptoms on new and unknown leaf samples, then to compare the model predictions with diagnosis that were made by nutrient concentration measurements, in other words, doing leaf analysis, and with human experts. Human experts would definitely come in into play when they weren't nutritional deficiencies, because obviously you can't necessarily 
send off spider mite damage and, and have that come back from a analytical lab. So that was the idea of using human experts too. And then they wanted to augment the deep convolutional artificial neural network images with leaf symptoms representing other causes, pests, diseases, plant growth regulators, basically the unknown class. So it's been trained to identify certain things and then the other, you, you have to separate out what it doesn't know to some degree so that you can reduce the background noise, so to speak. And then not part of this project, but part of the overall, or not part of the research project, but part of the overall project was to develop and validate finally a smartphone app that will use this artificial neural network. So as far as the smart, smartphone app, it's used to analyze citrus leaf symptoms with a smartphone. So that was kind of the idea of doing this. So you have these different leaf symptoms that we talked about before, some of the diagnostic parts of this. And you can see that you have canker and spider mites, and some of these things are fairly similar. So you want to be able to separate these things out, and that's what the smartphone app theoretically is going to do. So what happened was, as far as the development of the research project, was the neural network training. So in order to do this, they took a collection of digital photos of symptomatic and healthy leaves. They took these photos with a standard Android smartphone camera at one leaf per frame. So you're taking one leaf with a smartphone camera. The, the lens that you use on the camera is not the selfie lens, it's the other side lens, which is typically better resolution. And that's important because you want these, in order to get good data, you want them to, you want clear focused images. And they did this on approximately 600 images per class. Okay, you may ask, well, what were the classes? Well, there were 16 different classes of leaf symptoms that we looked at. Nutrient deficiencies such as nitrogen, magnesium, iron, manganese, and zinc. And if you think about those, some of those are similar. So that would be important to be able to, to parse those out, so to speak. Pests such as spider mites, spider mite damage, leaf miner damage, thrips damage, and Asian citrus psyllid damage. And diseases such as HLB, citrus canker, greasy spot, citrus cab, citrus scab, cab, citrus scab, and phytophthora, along with a category of healthy and then unknown. And this neural network training went on. It was trained until convergence, and there were 9,600 leaves taken in this project of these 16 classes, both sides. So remember, it was 600 leaves. You had 16 classes. They were done front and back. So now you have a collection of photos that approach 20,000 high quality images of these symptoms. So that's how part of the material and methods is how this neural network was trained. Continuing with the training, the validation for each system class was done. And then the photos for testing the model were separately obtained from independently sampled leaves. So we didn't use the same leaves. The trained model was used to predict with these test images. After photographing the leaves, again, laboratory determination of the nutrient concentrations were done by a commercial lab. And the validation accuracy was scored by percent correct diagnosis according to expert assessments of the leaves, as well as agreement with the nutrient concentrations that came back from the labs. So what did we find out? Well, after they got done training the neural network, network, the average accuracy of the 16 classes was 99.7%. The trained network was able to detect all nutrient deficiencies that it was trained on, on single leaves with 99 to 100% accuracy. It was able to distinguish between subtle differences in chlorosis expression between different symptoms, including dual symptoms like manganese and zinc, iron and manganese, and HLB. And this distinction between multiple, multiple symptoms is quite beneficial in real world applications because it oftentimes, it's oftentimes very difficult to parse out these multiple symptoms strictly by visual observation. I think a lot, at least from an experience standpoint, you would look at the leaves, you would identify the major deficiency, you would treat that deficiency 
if it was subtle, a second one that was subtle behind it, you wouldn't notice it until you treated the first one. Wouldn't it be great if you could treat both of them because they were there at the same time? So that's kind of the nice thing about what this app kind of does is it looks at those and it comes up with these combinations of symptoms many times. And there's also some nuances as far as with diseases. Um, there are leaf surfaces difference differences in pests and diseases from time to time. I'm thinking of pests, you would think leaf miner. It's on the back side of a leaf typically. Um, and in this case, we're looking at the symptom lesions of canker and greasy spot. They're strongly developed on the lower surface of the leaf. And the model from a prediction accuracy standpoint is significantly higher for greasy spot on the lower surface versus the upper surface because that is where the infection initially begins is on the lower surface of the leaf. So if it's initial infection, it does a much better job if you take a picture of the underside of the leaf versus the top side of the leaf. It still does well with the top side of the leaf, but from an accuracy standpoint, the bottom side with greasy spots seems to be a higher accuracy. And then the differences for were non-significant for citrus canker since typically the lesions, once they start on the bottom, they penetrate the entire leaf surface. So it shows up on the top and the bottom. They also trained the AI image classification models. <clears throat> and what they wanted to do was compare these to novice individuals and expert humans at diagnosing leaf symptoms. And I have to apologize somewhat for this slide. It didn't come out as well as I thought it would. But these are confusion matrix that were done by Percy on her master's thesis. And what this shows is if you look at the predict on the on the left panel, those are the experts. The novice are on the right side. The left side, if you look, the darker green means that typically for healthy leaves, the experts got 100% of what it really was. And so the darker green means that you were closer to being 100% at your predicted label, what you think it is and what it actually is. So that kind of shows you on there that a lot of the experts, you see a lot more green down that center, diagonally center, and then you do over with the novice is what you would expect. Now, one of the things that's nice about this app is that it can help you pull out differences in that are subtle because Many times some of the, the symptomology is very similar for something like nitrogen deficiency and phytophthora, like we mentioned before when we're looking at diagnostics. So if you looking at this confusion matrix, that's typically where you see the experts somewhat falling a little lower than 100% or close to 100% is those things that are very similar and there are very subtle differences. Can the app pick these up and then be able to help us do a better job of doing that? So what is this smartphone application actually? Well, what you do is you load up the, the app itself and I've got a, sh I'm gonna have a short little demonstration on how you get signed up and everything for this. So you can all start using it just, um, just as soon as we get done, if you want. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna open up the app itself. You're gonna take a photo of a leaf. You're gonna fill up the screen with a leaf. You're gonna use the photo. You're gonna submit the photo and then it's gonna give you a result. And this typically happens in a very, very short period of time. And we've got some demonstrations of that that I'm going to share with you. This is an example of the page itself on your smartphone. What it typically will look like is you'll take the picture, you'll submit it, and then what comes back is this indication of a percent from the model on what that symptom is. So you'll see in this first panel that it's 100 or HLB at 99%, greasy spot at 92, and iron at 98. So that's kind of what the results that you'll get back will look like. Now, sometimes you might get a couple and sometimes you might get unknown, which you can address differently. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. As far as the app itself, I've got a few little quick little videos here. Hopefully these show up for you that demonstrate how this should be used in the field to kind of give you an idea instead of leave you out here hanging. So you open up the app, you'll go out in the field, you'll select take a photo, and then what you do is you'll go out and you'll look for 
classic or, or standard examples of the deficiency or what you're looking for. Put the leaf in focus, take a picture. So it comes back 99% iron. And then there's more information. You click on more information, it takes you to a page that shows you a little bit more about iron deficiency to, to uh, reinforce the diagnosis, so to speak. And then if you click again, you can go and you can see the recommendations for treating iron deficiency in Florida. Here's one. Got the other one started a little ahead of time. This one is leaf miner. So if you'll notice that you take a picture of the leaf, you want the leaf in focus and you want to take a picture of what it is you don't know is there, the symptom that you can't identify. You don't want to necessarily take the other side of the leaf, although it does work that way. It works better typically if you have a classic example of the symptom that you can use. Here we go, this is another example. This is another one where front and back. So you take a look at the back side of the leaf and it's 100% greasy spot. And again, you can go here, you can look at additional information, the recommendations for control of greasy spot in Florida, some of our university publications, or it's linked to university publications. And I believe now it will demonstrate using this app, the same leaf, we're gonna flip it over, take the top side, as good greasy spot symptom development. Comes back 100% greasy spot. Oop. Gotta figure out how to get to that one. Oop. Well, I think I got them too close together here. And maybe I can play that one. Oop. Well, we may have to uh, forego this one right here. Um, oh, here we go. It is going to play. I'm sorry. Got them too close together. Here's just another quick example of looking for representative, representative symptoms and then making sure that you collect one that looks typical to the ones that you're trying to identify. You know, manganese at 100%. Again, we back it up or reinforce it with additional information so that if there is some discrepancy in what the app is telling you, you can ground truth it with information that we have. And it's all built there where you can have access to it all at the same time. All right. A little about, about the app, app itself. Um, it only just let me explain that it only works as well as the data that is input. So it's important to consider the following best practices along with some pitfalls that would result in less than optimal performance of the app. And with with the release of this app, we've noticed that there is, you know, sometimes what we try to do is is especially like when when I'm out in the field, I I try to see if I'm smarter than the app. And that's not that's not the point of the app itself. The point of the app itself is to collect or take photos of focused representative symptoms of what you're trying to find so that the app can do its job. It's not to prove in like in my case that I'm smarter than the app because that defeats the purpose. What you want it to do is in these classes, it works very well. And so these are some of the, say, best practices on how to take a photo. So some of it is that you want handheld leaves. They work um, better if you hold them by the petiole or if you cradle them in the hand. The leaf needs to be in focus. I, I can't stress this enough. If you have a camera that focuses, has a depth of, of focus that's very deep, and you're getting stuff in the background that's in focus, this is not going to work very well for you. I have an iPhone, has a little red square, put the little red square in the center, make sure the leaves in focus, take the picture. 
you want the leaf in focus. What's around it is kind of irrelevant as far as from a focus standpoint. You want the leaf in clear focus. And you want to use this vertical orientation with the petiole below, and you want to fill about 50 to 75% of the photo with the, the photo frame with the leaf. You can use, again, both sides of the leaf if you want. Um, so that's kind of the idea of what a good photo is. Now, what you don't want to do is you don't want to use leaves that are covered with water or sooty mold or dust or other things like that. You don't want to take photo. You want to take photos of individual leaves, not clusters of leaves, because what you're doing is you're focusing on the leaf symptom itself. You want to try to avoid artificial bright backgrounds that produce that will produce unpredictable results. You avoid want to hold. You don't want to hold the uh, leaf in a horizontal position because the frame typically is more vertical than horizontal. You don't want it to be so far away that it's out of focus or that it focuses too much of the background and not of the symptom itself. And one of the things too that if you take this and you go outside and you do it in direct sunlight and take a picture of a leaf, sometimes a reflected light off of that leaf with that camera isn't going to come back and give you an optimum response because the leaf is typically can be overexposed. So you don't want to necessarily do it in bright light, but you don't want to do it in the dark either. So you want to do it, take a photo of a leaf that has typically good contrast, that's that's visible good contrast so that it can give you the results that you're looking for. Well, now next what I'd like to do is I'm going to play a uh, video on instructions on signing up for the app. This is we're not computer programmers and this is a smartphone app that is web is, is web based. It's it's not one that you go to the Google or iPhone store to get We're we're running it off of a server. So what I've got is is because of that, there's some, you know, some nuances to signing up to it and we've had some trouble with that. So I thought I'd go ahead and demonstrate how that's done, what you should expect if you do this. The procedure I'm going to do is on a laptop in my office or you can it's laptop desktop. It's done on the web on, on a browser. So that's kind of how we're, I'm going to demonstrate it with this video. But it's basically the same procedure if you're signing up on a smartphone. And there are additional videos that when you go to the sign up, if you do it on your phone, there are instructional videos on how to how it would look on a phone. It's it's very similar, but there is maybe a little bit of difference. You might get a little confused. So we're going to go ahead and I'm gonna hopefully play this and I hope you all can see it and hear it all right. And then that will help demonstrate how you go about signing up because it's kind of a two it's it is a two part process. You need to sign up and then you need to get a validation or, or an activation email. So we'll take a look at this now. All right, good morning. As I had just mentioned a second ago, we're going to do this as a video in the presentation so that we can do a little bit better control of getting the login process down for you. And what we want to do is we want to actually Google search on the term make citrus great again. And as you Google search, search this term, you'll end up on a web page where it says make citrus great again. And that's going to be the landing page for the citrus research and extension desktop. That is through Dr. Schumann's lab. There's a couple of things here that are of interest. The smartphone app itself, which is listed here, you can go directly to it. And after you sign up and you activate your account, if you need to log back in using this interface, you can go here to the actual login, um, the sign in where you put in your username and password, and that will take you uh, to the program, to the app itself, if you have to come in this way so you don't have to go through all these menus. So for our purposes today, we're going to go ahead and just go through the normal process to show you where you would end up going. So you click the link here, takes you to the desktop, Citrus Research and Extension Desktop. Dr. Arnold Schumann's contact information is on this front home page. Want to click on the smartphone app, and then what you'll do is you'll land on the research for the app homepage, so to speak. And it talks about the project, the objectives, the title of the project, what it does, doesn't do, and the personnel that were involved in the project. It has a couple of little quick videos here. If you have some more interest in this and how it's done, you can look at some of the resources that are available here on this page. The important thing for us this morning 
this, we want to go ahead and get signed up to use the app. So where this flashy new is, you want to click to open the Citrus Diagnosis app homepage. So we're going to go to the homepage for the app. So this is actually the homepage for the app itself. The other one was the research homepage for the app, and this is the actual app itself homepage. And what it does is it has the instructions for which you need to use to sign up for the app because it's kind of a two-step process. You sign up for the app. Once you sign up, you'll get an activation email. You'll click on the link in the email, and that will activate your account. Now you can come back and log in to the app itself. So we're going to go through this process. This is the first page you come to when you sign up. There's some interesting, some additional interesting instructional videos that are down at the bottom here. They're not real long, so they're worth taking a look at because what it's going to do is explain how you can go about taking pictures and getting those uploaded into the phone, like some of the other information that we've already shared with you this morning. But they go through it, so it's there for a reference if you need to use it. And also, if you happen to end up coming in this way and you already have an activated account and you want to go in and log in, you can just click right down here at the bottom and it'll take you to the login page. Okay, so what we want to do first is we want to go ahead and click here first. We're going to view the sign up instructions again. You're going to sign up, you're going to get an email, you're going to get an activation link, you're going to activate your account. So what we want you to do is this is what the next page is going to look like. It's just going to have that little sign up box right in here. But what you need to do is you need to come up with a unique username for your account. That could be from four to 15 characters, but it's unique to you. Whatever you want it to be, we're not assigning them. It's up to you. We do ask that you enter a valid email address and that is required for activation. If you don't get the activation email, you can't use the app. So you put in a, a valid email address for yourself. Then you can make up your own password. We don't assign passwords. That's for you to decide what you want to use for this app. It can be from five to 80 characters. You want to write it down and remember it and don't lose it. If you go and you go through the process of signing up, there's a box that you know, most of these apps have boxes that say, remember me. So you can click on that. But if anything ever happens to your password files, then you need to have that so you can log back in to the app itself. So that's why we ask you to, if you choose to write it down, that's fine or do, do something that's easy for you to remember. So final one, click sign up and then we'll get, basically we'll go through this and show you what actually happens when you click the sign up and you get some additional instructions. All right, so we see step one, now step two is click here to sign up. So we're gonna sign up. I'm gonna use a username. I'm gonna use my notorious username right here, which is my normal initials and last name. Normal. I'm gonna use my University of Florida email address and then up with my own unique password. This point, we're going to click sign up. We're going to tell it not to sign. says welcome to the citrus diagnosis and what we're going to do is click for instructions once we click here there's another short video that can that will help you understand how to use the app that's right here it says important before you can actually use the app log in to use the app you need to get this activation code that's going to be emailed to you so what we're going to do here is there's some additional instructions on look at these instructions Click here for some tips. Um, you can return back to the app. There's a few things here. And now what we're going to do is wait on that email and see what, when it comes, let me switch screens here to see if it has arrived yet. All right, now we're at the, my email. What I want to do is send receive. And there it came. There is 
is my activation and there is my activation link. So now I'm at my email, I've got my activation link. Now I'm going to activate my account. So I'm going to click on this. And we're going to go back to the browser to see what that screen is. And now that we're back here to the browser, it informs me that a new account has been made and has been activated. And what I want to do is click here to use it. So I click on this link and it brings me to the actual app itself. So now I've gone through the process, process of signing up and I've submitted that information. I've gotten an email activation, an activation link email back to me. I've clicked on it and it's brought me to here where I can now put in my username. And then my password. Right now, I'm going to tell it to remember me so I don't have to go through this all the time. And then I'm going to go to sign in. I tell it not to save at this point. And this is actually the app itself. So, this is the interface for the app if you're on a desktop or a computer, a, a desktop computer or a laptop computer. This, this is what it looks like. And at this point, I got a few photos that I can show you how it works. You would do the same thing basically on your smartphone. When you download and you get logged into the account, you get to the app, you can go up there and you can save the link as an icon on your on your Android or your iPhone. And so you will have that icon on your phone itself, an app icon, and you click on it and it will bring you directly to this page. So you can, if you're out in the field, either drag not drag or add a picture to the to the square, or you can take a picture with your phone. In this case, we're going to look at dragging some pictures that we've already taken out in the field. We're going to bring them into this app and have them analyzed just to demonstrate how it's done. So I'm going to come over here, click on this one. I'm going to drop it right there. I'm going to submit. And it's telling me that that's iron deficiency. So then I can clear that. Let's say I have another picture. Went out in the grove. Somebody sent me an email. Actually, send me a text message a couple of days ago and said, hey, is this citrus canker? As an expert, I would look at it and I say, looking just based on that leaf, I don't get to turn it around or look at the other side, but I feel pretty confident that that's probably citrus canker. Well, I can use this to help me better validate my opinion or my, my yes, my opinion of whether this actually is citrus canker. As you see, it comes back 87% 80, citrus canker. So that's how you can use the app. If you have it on a desktop, you can use it this way. If you go out in the field and you take pictures, you take your pictures with a camera, you can typically do it right there in the field. If you just take pictures and they're uploaded to the cloud, you can come back and use the desktop and then you can drop the pictures in there to do the analysis. Or if you have a second camera rather than a phone that you use to take pictures of symptoms out in the field and those are uploaded, you download them to your laptop, you can then add those and go through those and have them go through the app here to give you an answer to what they may be. So with that, I think we pretty much have this done as far as the sign up process. And now I'm going to stop this video and then we're going to finish up with the presentation. Good morning. As I okay, hopefully I'm back on track and y'all can hear me. And hopefully you saw the instruction video there to sign up. And one of the things about using on desktop is in Florida, there are places out in the woods, so to speak, where citrus groves are. And a lot of times those areas may not have cell coverage. And because it is a web based app, they you, the pictures you take with your phone will stay with your phone. When you come into service, you can pull them back up and take a look at them. So from a standpoint of using it as an app on a laptop, that might be advantageous if you take some pictures and then when you come back into service, they'll get uploaded to the cloud. You can download them and look at them there or run them on your phone, just depending on where you are. It's kind of a, I think, a added feature to having that is being able to do that if you're on an area that doesn't have cell service and you can't run, run the analysis. So the smartphone app, some of the other spinoffs that I think or are, are from this research is 
maybe trying to understand how the trained AI, AI model is looking at when it diagnoses different symptoms. So try to make a sense of maybe what that app is looking at when it makes those decisions so that possibly when you see unexpected results, maybe what that at, what the AI model is looking at is something that can teach us to be better at visually identifying symptoms of disease of some of these diseases and nutritional deficiencies. So I think we probably can glean some of that information that can make us better at doing visual diagnosis. And the and another thing that we think can come out of this is to do an online leaf diagnosis training course using some of these 20,000 plus high quality images to help people train, be trained better in visual identification of these symptoms using the information that we have gained from this artificial intelligent uh, model. And um, hopefully we're going to be able to add more diagnostic classes such as melanose, sooty mold, potassium deficiency, and some of these things into the future. So it's not a done deal. Um, teaching new skills, teach the teacher kind of thing. Um, one of the things that it does do is you'll look here, there's a couple of photos. One of them here on the left is nitrogen deficiency with yellow veins. Now you have iron deficiency with green veins and yellow, yellow interventional areas. And what you can do is the app is able to pick up the subtle differences when you combine the two and you see the nitrogen plus iron deficiency with the interventional chlorosis and yellow midrib. How, and, and knowing how that works and what that app is looking at can hopefully teach us to be better at visually identifying symptoms in the field. That's part of the proposal of, you know, having an online type course that can help train us better. So conclusions, can an artificial neural network model successfully train, be successfully trained to identify healthy or symptomatic citrus leaves, nutrient deficiencies, pests and diseases? There was independent validation accuracy was 99 to 100% with the mean being 99.7 and agreed with the expert diagnosis and chemical analysis. Additional leads for new symptoms are being collected and added to the app once the model is retrained. And the trained networks are being deployed to smartphones for infield diagnosis of citrus leaf symptoms to not only extension agents, growers, homeowners, master gardeners, homeowner, grower types, and it's available for you also um, today and in the future if you go to the website and sign up for the app. There are some acknowledgments that I'd like to make. Um, these are listed here, the CREC lab team, the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center, um, the ag teams, precision ag teams up in Canada, and also the funding, the HLB multi-agency coordinated MAC funds, USDA SCBI, USDA SCRI, the Florida Strawberry Growers Association, and the Wild Blueberry Producers Association of Nova Scotia. And there is Dr. Schumann's contact information, at least his email. If you want to know more about the nuts and bolts of the artificial neural net, Arnold would be the one to contact Dr. Schumann on that particular aspect. I'm the one that gets this out to you, explains it to you, gets it out in the field so you all can use it. Um, and I had just one more little thing that I wanted to run over here as I finish up my time. As we go through this and we have used this app and we have identified some malady, what do we do with that information? Well, one of the things that we have in Florida is what we call this copper uh, citrus copper application scheduler, and that's the website for it. It's on a website that's called AgroClimate. And one of the things that I'm thinking would be beneficial is looking at this from the standpoint of we know that copper acts as a fungicide and a bacterial side. And with the app, maybe we go out and we identify that there's a certain pathogen that's out there that is susceptible to that is that it causes a problem but is can be controlled by something like copper such as in this case citrus scab melanose maybe greasy spot citrus canker or alternaria and citrus canker greasy spot and scab are already built into this ai app so if they identify those then a typical control measure in florida would be the use of copper fungicides or with canker bacterial sign 
So what this what this model does is it allows you to come in and put in some limited parameters. You can use the the drop down menus or for US or metric units. You can select a weather station. These are the FON, the Florida Automated Weather Network weather stations. So none of them are in Louisiana. But what it does is it actually it's not so much the weather data from there as it is the rainfall data. The rainfall data you can put in yourself. You can upload a rainfall, basically a, 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 a listing of rainfall in a com, com, uh, comma separated file. You can list, you can upload that and it will run the model using your data rather than one from a weather station in Florida. You can also pick the cyan, whether it's round oranges, grapefruit or mandarins, and then you put in your bloom date and your copper application dates. And so we'll take a look at that what that looks like. So this is just a dummy run that I did the other day, but what I did here was I used a weather station that's in the panhandle, at least it's in the same time zone as you guys, central, and uh, put in a variety, Mandarin, and then put in a bloom date of April 1st, and then ran the different the date along with the dates of sprays and what you can do is you actually put in the concentration of metallic copper along with the volume of water that you used in the sprayer and then what that does is it goes through and as you can if, if you look at the graph you can see where the rainfall occurs is in blue and then you can see the amount of residual copper is the graph itself so as that graph, as you add copper, make a copper application, the residual copper goes up and as time goes and you get rainfall and or fruit expansion, this model also considers fruit expansion, that you can see where the residual copper is and when it gets in close to that danger threshold, you can make another application of copper. So in that regard, it will help you schedule your copper for some of these diseases so you can better have an idea when to spray. How well it works in your area, you have spray schedules that you use, you might run this model in, in concert with what you're already doing to see how well it ground truths, but it's something, some additional information that you can put in to this model and compare to what you're doing to see if it could potentially provide you some additional benefit. And like I said, what it does is the simulation um, details you can look at those and actually what it does is it takes day days from bloom so it's considering the fruit growth and expansion residue of copper also considers rainfall and then when you make those copper applications so that's kind of a way that i kind of tied in the identification of using this ai this app with something like greasy spot or citrus canker well let's say citrus canker for fruit and scab and then you can bring that information back in because now you're going to use copper to protect the fruit, and so you can use this copper model. So they all kind of tied together, you know, to, to provide you with a, a better, potentially uh, more efficient way of managing your particular citrus crop. So with that, that is the end of my slideshow, and somebody can, I think, take over. Jeb, you there? Yes, I am. All right, well, Chris, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that's actually really neat. Uh, it's a wonderful tool that I'm pretty sure we're going to use for sure, and a lot of our um, clientele will be really excited about. We have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions for Chris, please just put them in your live Q&A, and we will ask him. Um, and we'll go through that and give you just a couple minutes to see what we get. Hey, Jeb, did you see? So everyone knows just how easy it is. Chris and Anna have already quickly gone on and signed up for the app. And Chris has already done some testing on citrus in his yard <laughs> just now. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it's it looks really, really nice, actually. I mean, I'm really excited to use it. <clears throat> Chris, we had one question. Um, it did say in your presentation that you use blueberries and strawberries to develop the app. 
Um, are there apps for those crops that are similar to this one for citrus? Thanks, Anna. No, what that was was it. Uh, it was object detection. It was to identify. It's not developed. Has been developed for those crops, and as much as looking at you know potentially diseases on strawberries, it was basically to identify and separate out on an object basis uh, a weed, Carolina geranium, from a strawberry plant when it was implanted in the field. So it's not that part of it was just more to detect an object rather than do a diagnosis. Perfect, thanks. Hey Chris, if there is a citrus psyllid on the leaf, when you take a picture of it, will it identify the psyllid? No, it will not identify the psyllid. It, it, it does the 16 classes that are there. It will identify psyllid damage on a leaf, but it will not identify a psyllid. And my experience with smartphone cameras is, I think you can get a pretty decent picture of a psyllid, but it has not been trained to do psyllids. Now from an object detection standpoint, there's some software I think that Arnold has developed, as I had shown in the presentation, where it can, it can find objects, but it's not, it's not, it's not set up to look at individual insects to find psyllids themselves, but it will find the psyllid damage if it's on the leaf and it can separate that out from thrips versus psyllids, which is somewhat beneficial. Yeah, that's really nice. So would it be possible to uh, incorporate into it later on where it identifies insects on the leaf or does it uh, identify insect damage like the the chewing of on the leaves and stuff yeah in the future i think there's yeah there are definitely additional classes of things that we can look at um i don't know where we are as far as pests themselves but since it, since we started out with just leaves we're pretty much delegated ourselves to look at only what is existing on a leaf that you can go out and you can take a picture of and then run it through the system. Um, as time goes on, we can add additional classes, whether those be live insects or other insect damage, for sure, insect damage on leaf, for sure. We could add additional information on that. Should be able, I would think, to do, you know, some stuff with, um, you know, with some insect, additional insect damage that shows up on leaves and, and maybe branch out into you know, insects and things like that, rather than just the, They'll still be on a leaf, but hope you know maybe we could get that to identify them. It should, I, I think it should be able to be done. We have another uh, question in the chat: Is the copper a cure for canker that is well on a well-established mature tree? Canker is not a cure. Canker is a protectant. That is the way we use copper in Florida as a protectant. It does not cure cop. It does not cure canker. All right, any last questions before we uh, thank Chris one more time? Great. Well, Chris, thank you so much. This was fantastic, very informative. I'm really excited to go download this app and start using it. Uh, and I look forward to potential growth in it. Um, thank you one more time, and we will all be giving you a virtual round of applause right now. All right, you're very welcome, and thank you very much for inviting me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay, before we get to our next speaker, I'm gonna play a short clip from the Moreau Foundation these are one of the primary sponsors of the Citrus Symposium and uh, the FUSE facility. If you boil down our mission statement, basically anything that improves quality of life in St. Bernard is our business. Education is an important focus for the Miro Foundation. We're preparing the next generation to become the leaders of St. Bernard Parish. We made land available for the only hospital in St. Bernard Parish, a 
the sheriff's substation, the animal shelter, and have established an arts district and the Arlene Miro Elementary School. We focus a lot of our energy on community building. Hosting events to bring people together advances our mission by the fact that it helps strengthen the community. The end result being that we create a community where we have improved the quality of life of the people who live here and to encourage more people to come here and to live here and to share the wonderful things we have in St. Bernard Parish. Okay, while we wait uh, for our next speaker to load up her slides, I just want to mention one more time, thank you to the Moreau Foundation and Dockville Farms. For those of you who traditionally attend live in person, uh, the Dockville Farm is where we host the Citrus Symposium. So hopefully next year we'll be able to be there in person um, and meet with all of you. Okay. Our next speaker is Jamie Rodriguez. Jamie's with the USDA Farm Service Agency County Executive Director for the New Orleans or for the Orleans area. And Jamie manages three USDA service centers in Edgar, Thibodeau, and Donaldsonville. Jamie has a bachelor's degree in animal sciences and a master's degree in extension education from LSU. Jamie, with that, uh, we're going to turn the reins over to you. Thank you so much for uh, joining. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me here today. Um, what I'm going to do, we have two major programs um, that are geared for towards citrus producers uh, that were written into the form bill that we administer through the USDA Farm Service Agency. Both of these programs are classified as disaster programs to help protect you uh, against some losses that you could potentially experience. And the first one we're going to talk about is commonly referred to as the NAP program. Uh, this NAP program is called Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program. And what the intent of this program is, is it's a risk management tool designed to reduce financial losses that occur when natural disasters cause a loss of production and prevent it planning of a non-insurable crop or agricultural commodity. Um, <clears throat> citrus and nursery plants do fall into this category. NAP provides coverage for non-insurable crops produced for food, fiber or bioenergy conversion, grazed forage consumed by livestock, inventory value crops, including floriculture, ornamental nursery, Christmas trees, turf grass sod, industrial crops, seed crops, and aquaculture, which includes ornamental fish. And um, for this presentation, we're going to learn some basic information about our NAP program, and we're going to review some policy information that's relevant to the intent of our NAP program, who NAP is serving, the coverage levels that the program offers, eligible causes of loss, and application requests for NAP coverage and assistance. Our target audience here is uh, we offer NAP coverage to landowners, landlords, tenants, and sharecroppers who share in a risk of producing a crop or agriculture commodity. And they're entitled to the share of that crop or agricultural commodity available for marketing from the farm or would have shared had the agriculture crop commodity been produced. Um, coverage information, we NAP first provides a basic coverage, which is equivalent to the catastrophic risk protection policy that is administered by the risk management agency through traditional crop insurance. Um, we do have a traditional service fee for our NAP policies that's associated with the coverage. Our basic NAP coverage is equal to 50% of the yield or the inventory value at 55% of the average market price established by FSA. So in order to get a payment here from this NAP program, you have to experience a loss due to a weather event or natural disaster that's in excess of 50% of your normal production. And that payment would be calculated at 55% of the market average price that is set by FSA, and we'll get into some of that a little later in the presentation. Um, we do offer additional levels of buy-up coverage 
um, those require an additional premium payment besides the regular service fee. Buy-up is available except for crops intended for grazing from 50% all the way up to 65% of the approved yield. And um, that base that goes in 5% increments. So you can buy 50%, 55%, 60 or 65% coverage. If you select to participate in buy-up coverage, it will pay out at 100% of the average market price established by FSA. We do have this online tool from the app that we offer online, and it allows you to determine whether your crops are eligible for federal crop insurance or our NAP program, and you can explore the best level of production for your operation. On this website, there's also a premium calculator that you could input the information in the acres and the number of trees from your operation to help determine what your premium cost would be. Payment limitations for the NAP program. Um, what a payment limitation is, is if you experience a loss and qualify for a payment with our basic 50-55 coverage, you would be able be eligible to receive up to $125,000. With the buy-up coverage option, you're eligible to receive up to $300,000. And this is annually during a crop year. Um, the, buy, the advantage of the buy-up coverage is in order to qualify, um, you can have a smaller loss and still receive a payment. To qualify for assistance under our NAP, uh, production losses have occurred as a result of an eligible cause of loss. Eligible causes of loss are included, but not limited to, damaging weather, drought, hail, excessive moisture, freeze, tornado, hurricane, and excessive wind. Adverse natural occurrence, which is flood, earthquake, and volcanic eruption, and a condition related to damaging weather or adverse natural occurrence, heat, insect infestation, plant disease, and volcanic smog, or any combination of the above. In order to participate in the NAP program, you have to apply for NAP coverage by the application closing date for your particular crop in your county. Applicants will be charged a non-refundable service fee, and NAP participants are required to follow the terms and conditions of the program to remain eligible for assistance. A certified report of the planted acreage, a notice of loss and application for payment have to be timely filed by the deadlines that are established by a form service agency. And then for our basic coverage, that payment limitation is 125,000 per crop year, which we know that increases with the buy-up coverage. Service fee for NAP coverage. Um, the lesser of $325 per crop or $825 per producer per county. So that if you if you have citrus orchards in one county parish, you, the maximum you're going to pay is $825 per crop. Um, when we say per crop, that's sumas, navels, blood oranges, lemons, grapefruit, just some examples of all separate crops. Um, if you are a multi-county producer in multiple parishes, 1950 per crop year is the maximum that you will have to pay for the NAP service fee. We do have some options for a service fee waiver for limited resource, socially disadvantaged, veteran, and beginning farmers. For our buy-up coverage, the premium is based on 5.25% of the coverage per crop, um, and it will not exceed $15,750 per NAP covered producer. Um, I have met with some producers about buy-up coverage, and um, in talking in my experience, the best way to decide is buy-up coverage fits your operation is to go ahead and calculate the premium and determine what your difference would be if you experience a loss in payout with traditional versus buy-up. It, it works for some people, but it's not a fit all for every operation. Not covered producers who are limited resources, socially disadvantaged or beginning 
veteran farmers or ranchers may request a 50% premium reduction for buy-up coverage. To apply for NAP coverage, uh, in order to apply for NAP coverage, you have to sign a form CCC 471, non-insured crop disaster assistance application and pay the applicable service fee at their local FSA account. If you've traditionally been participating in the NAP program, you will get a letter in the mail every year. Your coverage is continuous until you choose to cancel it as long as you pay the service fee by the application closing deadline. Uh, producers with NAP coverage must file if you are looking for NAP assistance because you suffered a loss. You have to file a notice of loss and an application for payment on the form CCC 576 notice of loss and application for payment for NAP at our local FSA county office. Um, in, in the pandemic, we, we've gone we have some many more virtual options available for you to be able to complete these processes. The notice of loss application for an application for payment must be completed within 15 calendar days or the earlier of the natural disaster or weather occurrence. The final planning date if planning is prevented by a natural disaster. The date that damage to the crop or loss production becomes apparent or the normal harvest day. And this is just the NAP life cycle. Um, first, you plant your crop, then you request coverage, approved yield. Um, in order to determine uh, your approved yield, if you are a new NAP producer, we will use four years worth of the county expected yield for your crop to establish you a base. Or, and then every year you will submit your production and we calculate that and that just keeps building upon your approved yield every year. And when we determine the loss, we look at what your approved normal yield is based what the loss adjuster who's gonna come out and look at your damaged crop determines as your yield. And that's how we're gonna figure out your percentage of loss. A commodity report, that's uh, an acreage report that we file every year on FSA 578. The deadline for citrus nursery crops is July 15th of every crop year. Then you will receive a summary of your coverage in the mail. If you experience a loss, you file a notice of loss and an app, then an application for payment. If you qualify, you receive that payment. And if you select it to participate in the buy-up coverage at the end of the crop cycle, the end of the crop year, that's when you will receive your billing for the premium. The service fees, however, are non-refundable and those have to be paid in advance of the application closing deadline. Your coverage period for NAP for a perennial crop such as citrus, other than a crop intended for forage, begins no later than 30 calendar days after the application closing date, and it ends the earlier of 10 months from the application closing date, the date the crop harvest is completed, or the normal harvest date for the crop. Um, I put a screen print up here from our national crop table just to show you some examples. This is navel oranges in Plaquemines Parish, non-irrigated, um, the unit of measure that we use for our NAP program here is 100 weights. You can see the acreage reporting date for citrus is July 15th of 2021. Our state committee has determined our normal harvest date here is February 15th of 2022 for the 21 crop. And the application closing date was November 20th of 2020. Um, that stays consistent every year. So at this point, we surpassed the application closing date for 2021. But if you were interested in applying for NAP coverage for next year, you would have to submit your application before that November 20th deadline. And then when we talked about the yield at the bottom for 2021, it shows you 
that uh, 98 as our county expected yield, and that's in hundred weights. And then the market average price is also in this crop table. And it shows you that our market average price in hundred weights for, for naval oranges for this year is $98 and five cents. Um, we do have different yields that are established and different market year average prices for organic production. So just a summary of our NAP program. Um, we discussed the customers that are um, eligible to participate, the program eligibility and requirements for the NAP program, eligible causes of loss, the options of basic 50-55 coverage and buy-up coverage, and then the NAP service fee and premiums, how we can apply in the NAP life cycle. I'm going to pull this slideshow down and we're going to start with our TAP slideshow that talks about our other program, which is also a disaster program that is geared towards citrus producers. So we, we like a lot of acronyms at USDA. We call this program TAP and it stands for the Tree Assistance Program. And the TAP program provides payments to eligible orchardists and nursery tree growers who replant and rehabilitate eligible trees, vines, bushes, and who produce nursery ornamental fruit, but on Christmas, but or Christmas trees for commercial production. Tammy, can I stop you real quick? Sure. I'm sorry, you're, you're still showing the uh, NCDA program presentation. Okay, let's see. I apologize. That's all right. Okay, can we see the tap? Uh, yep. Presentation now. Okay. All right. I Thank apologize. You. No problem. Uh, thank you. We'll start over with the, the tree assistance program. And, and what the tree assistance or TAP program does is it provides payments to those eligible orchards and nursery tree growers um, who replant, rehabilitate trees, vines, bushes, um, and who produce nursery ornamental fruit or Christmas trees for commercial production. Um, NAP as well has to be for commercial production. Your eligible causes of loss here, we have natural disaster and plant disease. Um, for NAP, plant disease has to be combined with some sort of natural disaster or weather occurrence. Here for TAP, plant disease is a standalone cause, eligible cause of loss. Um, there is a mortality requirement that you have to meet in order to qualify to receive a payment for TAP. Um, a, your loss has to be in excess of 20% uh, a mortality loss. And what that is, the TAP program uh, automatically at the national level says you have to have a 15% loss to qualify plus whatever the state committee determines is the normal mortality. Our state committee has determined that at 5%. Um, mortality definition is dead above and below the ground, no longer commercially viable, and that is to be determined by a trained FSA loss adjuster. To apply for TAP for a natural disaster, you must provide supporting documentation and apply by filing the CCC 899 form in our county office, and that has to be done within 90 days after the disaster event or the loss is apparent to the producer. Um, an example where we have seen that the loss apparent does not hit at the same time as, a, as the actual disaster could be um, when a hurricane brings in saltwater intrusion uh, in trees, you don't always see those effects right away. That, so you may, your loss apparent date may be several months after the actual event. You must certify and provide 
proof that your losses were direct result of the eligible natural disaster or plant disease with dated pictures, news articles, or plant pathology results. And that would be in the case of plant disease. Um, for the plant disease loss period, it begins when a producer first recognizes the disease in the stand and ends when an infected tree becomes either biologically dead or no longer commercially viable within the loss period established by the state committee and the deputy administrator for farm programs. In order to apply for TAP for plant disease, you must call the county office to report the presence of the disease, file a CCC 899 application in the county office. The state committee has to request a cumulative loss period for disease to the deputy administrator of form programs. Producers must submit reliable documentation to support a confirmed prognosis, uh, such as plant pathology reports, entomology lab reports, um, or some other type of verifiable documentation. And the, the TAP is a process. This is a cost share program. It does not play, pay a flat rate. Um, it pays a cost share of your expenses to replace and rehabilitate your trees. So the first step is to file the application, provide the reliable documentation, and once you file that signed application, FSA is gonna send that loss adjuster out for a field visit. He's gonna determine your losses, the total trees in the stand, number of trees damaged, and the total acres in the stand and how many of those acres are damaged for each stand. When we talk about stands, um, each crop that you have is going to be a separate stand. You have, have separate orchards that um, are non-contiguous. They, they aren't right next to each other. Those are gonna be separate stands as well. And, and your loss per percentage for the required mortality percent of that, in excess of 20%, is gonna be determined on a per stand basis, not for the entire orchard. So you may have some stands that will qualify, whereas some don't. The CCC 899 can be finalized when the producer requests to file one cumulative 899, capturing all loss in the, during the approved loss period. And that would be for plant disease, and that has to be set by state committee and Deputy Administrator of Foreign Programs. The producer must complete all practices within 12 months from the date that the 899 was approved by the county committee. The producer must provide all dated receipts in their name for TAP practices completed. How oh, any trees you bought, um, any labor you paid, chemicals, fertilizer, equipment that you use to help replant and rehabilitate your trees. Um, I, I put on here specifically canceled checks for labor expenses um, because sometimes that was an issue trying to provide documentation uh, when labor expenses were paid out in cash. Uh, we've also used various payroll documents uh, to account for those labor expenses as well. Upon completion of the practices, the loss adjuster and make the final visit to your form to verify completion. All approved practices must be completed for the payment. TAP extension requests if a producer cannot complete the practices within 12 months, the state committee can approve an extension of up to an additional 12 months. Anything after that, if you still for some reason cannot uh, complete those practices with the extension of uh, for extenuating circumstances, state committee can send that request up to the National Deputy Administrator Form Programs for an additional extension. Um, eligibility requirements. Um, you have to show that you are a commercial producer. A AGI is adjusted gross income. You have to be compliant with these provisions, which is $900,000 or less of your adjusted gross income for the applicable tax years. And you certify that on a form CCC 941. Um, we send those to the IRS for entities, individuals, 
and individual members of entities to certify that compliance. Uh, AD 1026 is a highly erodible land conservation and wetland certification. Uh, once you fill out that form, if there's not a wetland determination on that form, um, NRCS will, will then determine one. Um, a CC 902 is a form plan. It, <clears throat> what it's gonna say is, um, this is your entity, these are the members. Um, do, is this person a minor child or, or US citizen? Um, and you have to meet that, those foreign person provisions as well, which was, is being um, a green card or a United States citizen. Timely filed acreage report every year is July 15th of the crop year. So for 2021, um, in order to be eligible for these programs, you want to contact our office to file your acreage report by July 15th. We're going to need the acres of your orchard. If a form is already established, if not, we're going to have to establish you a form in our form record system. And we're going to need the number and variety of trees that are in your orchard. Um, and then there are also some environmental compliance uh, that we have to meet those requirements as well. Eligible citrus orchard tap practices. Um, we discussed that this was a cost share. And, and for each practice, there's a maximum rate that's established by the deputy administrator of form programs for each practice. However, it does not exceed up to 65% for replacement and replanting costs or 50% of rehabilitation, pruning and site preparation costs of your expenses that you turn in at the end of your completion of those practices. So these are the maximum rates and the rates that we will not exceed. Um, so 75% is the payment rate for all of these practices for beginning and veteran formers. Our definition of beginning formers is if you have been forming for 10 years or less. Eligible citrus nursery tap practices, we have that same 75% payment rate for beginning veteran formers. Nursery tree replacement, your maximum there is $5 a tree. However, you can only get paid for up to 65% of your expenses. So if your expenses don't meet $5 a tree, then you'll only get paid for 65% of what your actual expenses to replace those trees cost. Planting costs, maximum $2 per tree, six or 65% of your expenses. Nursery tree rehabilitation, up to $3 a tree or 50% of your expenses there. TAP payment limitation and eligibility. Um, currently, there is no payment limitation for the TAP program. Um, so depending upon what you qualify for based on your expenses and the maximum, um, you won't cap out at a limit like you would with the NAP program. OK, and, and that concludes my presentation about our TAP and our NAP program some additional uh, information that we have. This is the contact information for our county offices. Um, the NRCS, which is the Natural Resource Conservation Service, our sister agency, they also offer um, conservation planning for your operation to see how you can incorporate some of those conservation practices there to improve your operation. And we have Morton Fotno, who is our form loan officer, that services our area. He has several form loan opportunities, one of which is emergency form loans during times of disaster. He also um, does operating loans. You can get a form loan to purchase a form, and you can also go through the micro loan process, which is up to $50,000, and it's supposed to be a more streamlined, quicker process of getting access to funds to be able to assist you with your operations. And that's all I have Excellent. today. Does anybody have any questions? Excellent. Excellent.
Well, thank you, Jamie. Yes, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A and we'll get them covered. We have yeah. one question um, right away, and that is if you've never applied for NAP or signed up, does the initial sign up have to be prior to the disaster or can it be within 15 days or so? For example, the current freeze. OK, that that's a really good, good question. Um, uh, unfortunately, for the NAP program, if you've if you've never signed up for it before for the 2021 crop year, the deadline to sign up for that NAP program was November 20th of 2020. So, so we've exceeded the, the deadline to be able to sign up for 2021 NAP. So if you're interested in that coverage in the future, please contact our office before November 20th of this year, and we could go ahead and, and get you set up with a policy and, and a county expected yield. So that way you are covered in the event that we were to experience additional losses in 2022. Um, filing the, the 15 day of the um, disaster, that's to file a notice of loss once you've already have an application for coverage. It's, it, NAP is similar to an insurance policy. It's not, it's, it's just a, a loss protection, but you have to have the policy by the application closing deadline, which is, is the, the end of the year before the crop year that the disaster would occur. Thank you. Any other questions? Jamie, is there a, a minimum number of trees uh, for an orchard that you would recommend this program applying for? Um, we have a lot of smaller urban growers with say 20 to 30 trees. Is this something that they should look into? Um, it, it is definitely something that they could look into um, because the the 50 percent, you know, loss for for NAP, the NAP program, you know, they would they would still be eligible to get a, a payment for that and, and help absorb some of um, the burden of that loss. No matter the, the size or scale of the operation, we have some very large ones. Um, we have some very small producers who've participated as long as they are actually selling commercially, you know, that they would qualify. Awesome. Thanks. That's great news, especially for some of these smaller growers. They're mostly doing like farmers markets or direct to restaurant sales. So this is definitely something I'll pass along. Um, something else we have coming up in June, um, kind of exciting for our Orleans area and our urban growers. Um, the New Orleans area was selected as one of the urban areas uh, nationwide to start an urban county committee. And, and what that urban county committee is going to do, it gives producers the opportunity to decide if they want to go through the right in, in that area, if they want to go through the regular county committee or the urban county committee. Um, it, it's kind of we're going to select members, you know, who are urban producers. We have three areas for the New Orleans area that's established. It, it will be um, an election process for that, and we're supposed to do some community outreach as well, encourage um, agriculture. Some parts of it sounds like similar to an extension program and, and kind of help increase access to food for people in those urban areas. That's great. Good to hear. OK, any other questions? Oh, um, I have another question from the chat board. Is an application needed for various crops? So if you were growing multiple crops, would you need to apply for each crop or is it all included in one? That is correct. You would have to apply for each crop separately. It's all going to be on the same form, but each crop is a different pay code and a different service fee. So if you apply only, um, and, and it's up to a producer to decide what's best for their operation. If you have majority satsumas and maybe just a few navel orange trees in your orchard, you may decide you only want to insure those satsumas. 
but if you suffer a loss, then only those satsumas that you have on your policy are going to be what is covered by the program. Any last questions for Jamie? All right, well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk with us today. Uh, some really important information that our commercial growers really need to uh, need to help with and understanding. So um, thank you so much. We're having our virtual applause for you right now. <laughs> and just to remind everyone, because we've been getting a lot of questions, all these presentations will be posted online. Um, we are recording this and they will be posted on the LSU Ag Center website as well as uh, louisianacitrus.org and the LSU Ag Center Hammond Research Station website within the next week or two. Um, so that, thank you thank so you much, so much again, Jane. Right. Thank you, it was a pleasure. All right. Okay, everyone, I hope you're back. Uh, we really appreciate you sticking with us. Um, we're going to watch a video on the FUSE facility and hear a little bit more about some specific research, container citrus production research going on uh, upcoming for this next year. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to discuss some of my thesis research that's going to start this uh, calendar year. We are focusing on satsumas, as we mentioned in some of the earlier videos and presentations. And this is going to be a containerized satsuma trial, but it's really going to set the stage for years of future research. Um, we hope to have some really good in in outcomes of this uh, research project that are sort of going to guide what we investigate and really put our time towards in subsequent years. So some of our initial challenges and goals, uh, we were lucky to receive a specialty crop block grant through LDAF and the USDA. This has ensured that we have funding for this project for the next couple of years. And we have some initial um, things that we want to focus on through that specialty crop block grant. Um, first and foremost, we're going to establish a containerized citrus orchard, again, focusing on satsumas within the FUSE facility. We're going to produce a management guide and conduct field days for growers. So unfortunately, we can't do that this year. However, next year, 2022, I think a large part of the citrus symposium itself is going to take place in person within this facility. So we should have some real things to show you guys um, coming up next year. And I'm pretty excited about that. 
Uh, we're going to use utilize that fuse facility for the containerized orchard um, with future research projects through the LSU Ag Center and the Miro Foundation support. Um, so this is just where we're starting and really the sky is the limit because we have such a really good facility and we have some funding to throw at these questions for the Louisiana citrus industry. So just some real quick, some containerized citrus basics. Um, I know Chris Oswalt touched on some of the research taking place at the University of Florida, uh, the Lake Alfred Citrus Research Area, and they really did pioneer the U.S. system of containerized citrus. Uh, here in the photo, you can see a grapefruit on the right hand side. This is out of Florida where this is a dwarfed grapefruit tree and you see it's just loaded with fruit. And a lot of the initial research coming out of their CUPS facility, Citrus Under Protective Screening, is showing that for a fresh fruit market, these containerized systems can be profitable. They can produce a better tasting, better quality of fruit um, for that fresh fruit market versus a juice market. You know, they're really struggling with some of the same challenges we are as an industry with the citrus canker, citrus greening, and the Asian citrus psyllid. So we're hoping that the FUSE facility kind of gives us a leg up here in the state to investigate some ways of managing those issues uh, for our growers. So we will be planting our orchard in the next couple of weeks, which is really exciting. And we're gonna use these number 10 air pruning smart pots. And what's great about these is they do expose that outer root layer to the air and naturally dwarf the trees, naturally prune those roots so we don't have to repot and pot back up these trees, um, which can live for decades. So this is a really good time-saving technology. It's a newer technology that's being used in other applications within the nursery industry. And we're really excited to give this a whirl with Satsumas. Uh, they will be planted into a soilless media that helps us. Um, we can design some different things there. Irrigation fertilizer applications will be done um, through fertigation. And what we're worried about mostly in terms of pest control, disease control, you know, this is a protected facility, but that screen material does not exclude all mites or scale insects. So we will have to do some frequent scouting and hopefully develop some management practices for growers um, within the FUSE facility. So some things to look out for. So my research thesis has two parts. The main part is focusing on Satsuma growth and development using these smart pots. And within that grant, that specialty crop block grant, we did write in that we want to identify optimal planting density of this citrus cultivars um, for commercialized production. So Satsuma is grafted onto a dwarfing rootstock, trying to find how many trees we can cram into this space still with a good production level, um, you know, that's not going to happen for two to three years easily, but sort of taking some measurements, um, studying how dense we can pack these, how they're growing, how they've developed. These are going to be young trees that we're installing in the facility, but we do want to track this throughout their growth cycle. So we've chosen two cultivars, um, the old standby Owari, um, you know, it's been around a long time, but it is kind of the go-to um, in the Gulf Coast. And then also Brown Select, that's a little bit more compact tree, as a lot of you know, a little bit earlier market, um, and it's also readily available as a cultivar um, with a significant market share and economic importance regionally. Uh, traditional orchard spacing is roughly 650 trees per acre, but within this facility, we can get pretty packed in there. So we're going to look at four planting densities, which shake out to about 500 trees per acre, which is super low density. Um, all the way up to 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000 trees per acre. And we're going to replicate this four different times and take measurements. We're also going to study perceived yield. Now, you know, citrus trees take a while to get up and be productive. It's going to take two to three years before we even start picking a crop. But we can measure some things in the meantime that point towards prospective yield in the future. Um, what we want to do is really identify yield differences in the containerized production system of Satsumas versus a traditionally field grown orchard. And a lot of this work in grapefruits is being done at Florida, so we're excited to pursue that with Satsumas. Um, what they're finding over in Florida is that they have excellent production results in response to yield and fruit quality using the cup system both in-ground and in-container grown ruby red grapefruit. So they're focusing pretty hard on grapefruit over there. 
Um, we do grow some here, but we are really kind of putting all our efforts at the Satsuma crop. Uh, control trees grown in, outdoors in the field and in containers in Florida had 100% um, citrus greening infection and the yield and fruit quality was negligible, but within that cups that protected screen facility at Lake Alfred, uh, those cups grown trees ended up producing sooner, two years after establishment versus three to four years. And the fruit quality and yield was very high. So that's that's really encouraging for us in Louisiana um, because a lot of our Satsumas are destined just for grocery store sales or farmer's market sales, fresh fruit versus juice fruit. So the Satsumas and Fuse will be managed for canopy growth, measured for development, as well as bloom measurements and count. That's all stuff we can do in the next couple of years. So why does that matter? Well, it sets the stage for a lot of future research. Um, we can't start experimenting on an indoor containerized orchard without establishing an indoor containerized orchard. So this is really just setting the stage for what we hope is years of research moving forward. The big question on all of our growers' minds and all of our minds is, is this an economical system? Is it profitable? And is that yield and fruit quality of the established trees within the Fuse Canopy Project um, gonna shake out so that it's worth investing in the infrastructure it takes to manage this kind of orchard inside? Um, scalability, is this gonna make sense for smaller growers or home growers as a citrus greening and Asian citrus psyllid management tool? You know, if you look at the greater New Orleans area, home citrus and backyard citrus are really suffering um, from HLB and ACP. And, you know, we see a lot of hot trees just as LSU Ag Center agents, and then LDAP does come out and test them. And it's become a huge problem, especially with the urban growers and the backyard growers. So is there a scalable um, solution where we can cover some of these containerized trees, which are super popular with a screen structure? So that's something to think about in the future. Um, as Jeb mentioned earlier, variety development for containerized orchards, focusing primarily on rootstock selection, that's in that initial grant as well. And then we've talked about interplanting with high value crops. So we have a two to three year lag time before this um, orchard really starts producing indoors in the fuse system. What do we plant in the meantime to generate some income for farmers? And some things they've been looking at around the world really with these systems include ginger, papaya, um, we're even looking at raspberries potentially. So some ways of intercropping and making the most of that facility and generating income in the interval it takes for that orchard to come online. Another big question, hurricanes and freeze events. Um, this facility is located in St. Bernard Parish. It's a coastal parish, uh, we do get hurricanes and we're all kind of eagerly waiting to see how this thing makes it through. Um, freeze events, it is creating a microclimate with that screen structure, so we might have a bit of a buffer. A few degrees can make all the difference, um, as we know coming out of this last week. So those are really some of the, the future questions that we hope to address with this facility and which, with the research coming out of it. This is my contact info. I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, you know, once we get up and running with some trees, um, getting some people in there to take a look can be a potential thing. Um, we also have that louisianacitrus.org website up and running. That's where I'm going to be posting a lot of photos and sort of current um, things that we're noticing with the fuse system as we really get these trees going and start conducting research. So make sure you check that page. Um, for updates throughout the year. And as I mentioned before, next year we'll have actual stuff for you to look at, which is super exciting. And uh, I'm hoping I can dedicate the next three to four years to this just in my education. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity. Um, big thanks to the Muro Foundation for making what was a kind of a pie in the sky dream, actually concrete and it's built, <laughs> it's actually happening, and it's been a long time coming. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you, Anna. So we have one question. Are fuse operations NAP and TAP eligible? And I don't know if... Ooh. 
Jamie is still on. I do not think she is, but that's a great question, and we will definitely contact the uh, USDA. I don't see why they wouldn't be. But yeah, I don't see why they wouldn't be either. Um, another question we have is about bees in inside the uh, enclosed structure. Uh, do we not need bees? Uh, no, that's correct. We do not need bees. Um, as you've seen from these facility shots and the footage we've taken, there's an awful lot of fans within this facility and citrus is wind pollinated, self pollinating. So we don't actually need the bees to, to make a crop. Um, we can set these fans on a timer so we can run them a little bit more maybe when, when they're blooming. But yeah, we're not really concerned about pollination being an issue. If you stand inside the facility, you can feel the wind coming through um, and rain does come through it as well. So it is kind of like just being outside slightly modified microclimate temperature wise and shade wise, but it is open to the elements. So they will be pollinated just like they would be in an orchard um, where there's maybe not a lot of honeybees. Mm -hmm. You can buy some pollination kits, um, little bumblebee hives. We can look into that maybe in the future. Um, where they're bred to be used inside enclosed facilities like greenhouses and screenhouses. Um, but initially, we're just planning on relying on plain old fashioned wind and that fan system. Thanks. Any other questions for Anna? And just to reiterate what she just said, we are not currently using bees or pollinators, but if you were to set up a backyard greenhouse system there's nothing that says you can't um the point we don't want to is we don't want the the pests to get in so either the bees would have to stay in there for their entire life cycle or you'd have to create a port for them to get in and out which would also allow other pests to get in so correct Uh, we have a question on what is the cost per acre and we are I'm going to jump in on that one. We're still figuring that out. So we, there's a lot of ways you can do this. We have a very high tech facility. We were doing research so we want to have a very robust facility. So we had a, a reasonably high cost per acre uh, to build a high end screen house gutter connected screen house. But for just a screen, you can go as low as a post and cable connected structure and cover it with a screen like you would a shade house and make it very reasonably cheap per acre. It all depends on your facility, what you want and what you want out of it. But we are we don't have hard numbers for you. Uh, and that is one of the things we're going to be researching in the first year or so on actual production costs and trying to estimate yield back to get some information on return on investment. Yeah, that's an excellent question too. Um, if you look at what commercial groves are doing in Florida, it really is that post and cable system and it's been proven to be economical for them. So we're hoping to have this facility, which is really the Cadillac version, um, but also maybe in the future set up some trials on farm where we use some of that post and cable lower tech solution, um, which really does provide the same benefits in many ways. Great. OK, well, yeah. there's. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yes. I just called Jamie about the cap cap question. OK, and she says that she is 99 percent sure that it would be covered because um, they cover stuff grown in greenhouses. And even though it's production, it would probably fall under. Uh, it could fall under an orchard or as a container grown uh, crop. And she says she's 99 percent sure it would be covered and she's going to get us the definitive answer uh, up to 100% uh, Monday and then we can put that on with the uh, presentations that we have. So it's 99% sure it would be covered and we'll know for sure come Monday. That's great to know. I appreciate it, Joe. OK, to keep on schedule, we're going to move on. If you have any more questions for Anna or any of our speakers, please continue to put them in there and we'll try and get them set up for um, or get them answered after the event. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to load up our next presenter, Dr. Raj Singh.
I think many of you who have come to this event know Dr. Singh uh, pretty well. He's one of our stars here for the Citrus World with the LSU Ag Center. Uh, Dr. Singh is an associate professor with the LSU Ag Center and a statewide extension specialist for plant pathology. Dr. Singh is also the director of the Plant Diagnostic Center at the, on the LSU Ag Center campus. So if you're sending samples into LSU to check for disease or any nutrition def deficiencies or pest damage, Dr. Singh is managing the lab that is taking care of all that. So uh, Dr. Singh, if you have a chance, you want to share your slides, I can get them put up live. Can you see them? Yes, we can. Let me slide, put you in there. Um, sending in. Okay, I think we're good to go. All righty. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. <laughs> um, uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, this this uh, is the afternoon yet? No, I don't think so. Um, still, good morning. Uh, so, this morning, I'm going to talk about the research that we did uh, for past couple of years on the susceptibility of Setsuma cultivars to citrus canker. Um, we, we chose because Satsuma is one of the, I would say, out of all the citrus, Satsuma dominates our citrus production. I forgot, before I uh, start my presentation, I would like to acknowledge my co-presenter on this one. She's not here, but she did a lot of field work on, on this uh, uh, research. So uh, Monique D'Souza, she's a PhD in entomology. Um, she's from Brazil, um, but she's been doing work with me uh, for last three, last couple of years. So uh, let's start. I want to give you a little background uh, on citrus production. So uh, we did this some research that found out that total 8 million tons during 2018, 2019 growing season. And it was up by 30%, 31% compared to the 27, 2017 to 2018 production. So despite of all these diseases like canker, greening, uh, scab, melanose, greasy spot, Asian citrus psyllid, and other, other viral diseases, still it was up by 31%. Uh, uh, out of all those diseases, citrus canker is one of the most devastating diseases worldwide. The reason I'm saying that when you compare citrus greening and citrus canker, citrus canker is very contagious, whereas greening you need a uh, vector to transfer the disease from health, from infected to healthy trees. And so that's the reason I'm calling citrus canker is one of the most devastating diseases. When, it, we, when we are concerned about uh, production in Louisiana, because our climate is very, very conducive for this disease to develop and spread at a much faster rate maybe compared to other, other citrus growing areas. We are hot and humid, and that's what this bacteria like to have as a microenvironment. <clears throat> Uh, this is just a list. Uh, this was done by uh, researchers in Florida. Uh, so the the list is from most susceptible or highly susceptible citrus to the least susceptible citrus. And if you notice, Sasuma oranges is somewhere in the middle of that list. Um, but we have seen some previous studies where a citrus a Sasuma was considered kind of like a resistant to some of the some of the canker strains that we have in the in, in worldwide. Uh, when we talk about citrus canker in Louisiana, this is not the first time that we have citrus canker. Um, citrus canker first came uh, to Louisiana in 1914. Uh, it was first uh, reported from Florida in 1910. And during those uh, three, four years, it moved towards these Gulf Coast. And so we had canker in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. Uh, so during that time of time period, there was a lot of citrus trees that were uh, removed and uh, then in the 1940s, uh, or I would say from 37, 36 to 37, uh, during that time, a big survey was done and uh, tens of thousands of trees were sampled or uh, scouted and no canker was found in 1940s. 
So uh, this was the second time when we found citrus. Our um, department, our USDA inspector, found citrus uh, in June of 2013, and it was reported from New Orleans City Park on sweet orange. Now that sweet orange tree was only three years old, uh, but it was full of canker. So uh, we we kind of uh, had some. Uh, theories of how it got into the state uh, after almost um, a, a century. Okay, um, So uh, when we looked at the tree, it didn't have any older cankers on the stems or on the petioles or even on the fruit that was dropping on, on the ground. Okay, So we, we had this theory that there might be some other um, canker diseased grapefruits or other highly susceptible mild lemons that are out there and they were the source of inoculum. Um, or it could be because of one of the hurricanes uh, that went over um, Louisiana that could have brought it into Louisiana because it can spread with the hurricane uh, hurricane events. Uh, Right now, there are only 10 parishes that are under quarantine, uh, but canker has been also confirmed from East Baton Rouge Parish, Livingston, and St. Martin. Um, as uh, uh, Tina this morning mentioned about those quarantines. So uh, I believe it's going to change soon that East Baton Rouge Parish and Livingston and St. Martin, they have some kind of quarantine limits, quarantine boundaries in those, in those parishes. Uh, in terms of Satsuma, as I said earlier, uh, it is the most dominating citrus that we have here in Louisiana, about 63% of total citrus acreage. And these number can fluctuate e on either side. Uh, these were done by LSU Ag, uh, summary of 2018 numbers. Uh, the 2019 still not there because of the COVID-19 situation. Uh, but in 2018, um, 183,000 bushels of sesumas were produced with a total gross farm value of 6.2 million. If you look at the total value of citrus industry, that stands about 10 million, uh, including the nursery production, nursery stocks, and the production outside. So it is still a dominating uh, cultivar here in, in Louisiana. But if you look at the production of sesumas during last 10 years, it has drastically dropped by about 54,000 bushels. And the reasons are several, uh, including Hurricane Katrina. After Katrina, you, you all know the research station was closed. Uh, a lot of citrus groves were abandoned. And then citrus greening came in 2008. Or sweet orange scab was confirmed in 2010. And then citrus canker 2013. So, all of these events, because of all these events, our production um, has decreased over years. But I think with these new opportunities as the Fuse uh, Citrus Excellence Center, uh, there will be a research that will promote the citrus production here in Louisiana, and, and we will see an upward trend in uh, sesuma production. Um, so when we talk about uh, citrus canker and sesuma, why we did this research? Uh, this was the, the, the data came out of the CAPS survey. If you know what CAPS is, CAPS stands for Cooperative Agriculture Pest Survey. So it's mostly done by Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry. So what they do is they will send the inspectors out, do a survey, and they will bring in the samples back to us. And then we will uh, document those samples. We'll test those samples with specific assay for citrus greening or citrus canker or other diseases too. So during those two years, when we when we uh, examined those samples, uh, we found out that uh, there was a big number of samples that came out of sesuma trees only, but only 2.5 percent or two out of those 79 samples tested positive for citrus canker. Now this is the these are the two years before we applied for the specialty crop grant. Okay. Well we are seeing the similar trend afterwards too in the, the subsequent years in 2017, 2018, 2019. So from that we we found out that there is there is some uh, some sort of tolerance or resistance available in citrus uh, in Satsumas particularly that we can use to see 
uh, promote those sasomas, but one of the lacking points in that in that survey was that we didn't know what kind of sasomas were uh, <coughs> were submitted. Okay, when we had uh, we know ruby red grapefruit or something, like, but sasomas were just sasomas. Uh, so that that was information lacking, and that was one of the objective to see which commercially available sasomas are susceptible, are resistant, or susceptible to canker. Um, so the the funding was uh, was uh, fun the the research was funded by specialty crop law grant program uh, offered by USDA, and it is coordinated by Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry. And we got about eighty seven thousand uh, dollars for about. Two years, uh, two year study plus about six months to analyze the data. So the research was completed in May of last year. Okay, we started in October of 2017, but research was completed uh, last year in 2020. Uh, <clears throat> so what we did uh, in 2018 growing season, we selected four sites, two commercial orchards, one backyard, and one public garden. And in 2019, there were only two sites left, one commercial orchard in Paulina and one public garden in New Orleans. Now, <clears throat> when we, uh, we, if you all remember, we had a hard freeze in 2017. And because of that, we didn't have a, a whole lot of inoculum present on the infected trees. And I'll show you those numbers later on too. Um, so that was the case when in 2018 we did the, the analysis uh, at the end of that year, we found out that two uh, sites, uh, they didn't have any disease because the, the disease trees didn't have enough canker on them. Okay? So those two, two sites were uh, finally uh, finalized in 2019. Uh, we wanted we didn't want to spray the trees with the canker bacterium because it is a quarantine pest so we have to be uh, we can't just culture it out and start spraying some trees out there because there is a chance that you can uh, spread that inoculum so we wanted to have a natural source of citrus canker inoculum that will cause the disease on the healthy trees uh, so we we had these grapefruit trees because it is highly susceptible to canker. And when you look at the diseased grapefruit trees, you can see the difference between how bad the disease on, uh, on your uh, grapefruits compared to your either your navel orange or Washington, Washingtonia or your, uh, or your Meyer lemon. So that's why we chose grapefruits uh, trees. Now, there were two situations we wanted to include uh, more sites, but then it also depends on how much you can do within a week, because if you have more sites, then you have to go to each site every other day. So we, we decided having two sites. And in this site, we wanted to include two different situations. One is an open orchard and one is a, a, like a backyard situation. We didn't want to do it as at a backyard, so we chose a public garden where we had this uh, grapefruit trees, in fact, diseased grapefruit trees, but they were fenced by like a, a brick fence, okay, a brick wall. So uh, this is just like a, a methods uh, slide. You don't have to worry too much about it, but we selected five sesumas. Uh, Brown Select was one of them, Louisiana Early, Miho, Owari, and St. Anne. Uh, we tried to select these in a way that there are some early maturing and late maturing, the fruit size, uh, try to incorporate all different kind of sesumas in that. Uh, also, why we selected five? Because they were mostly available out there uh, in, in the industry. Uh, at the same time, we also selected ruby red grapefruit. Remember that list I gave you, the ruby red grapefruit and the kumquat, the list. Uh, so we selected a ruby red grapefruit as a highly susceptible cultivar. Then we chose a Hamlin sweet orange, which is a medium uh, susceptible, and then a sweet kumquat that didn't have a disease in the previous literature. So and we got really good, interesting uh, data from this study. Um, so the the plant, the trees that we chose, they were kind of like when you will buy those trees and plant them. So we chose 18 months old potted trees. Uh, they were used for the experimental units. And uh, this is again some materials. We had five trees for each cultivar. 
Now we replicated that three times, uh, both years at both sites. So we had about 480 trees that we screened during those two years. And that's kind of, a, 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 I would say, a valid number when you're talking about a field research. So. Um, the replications were there, the uh, replication over time was there, and we did at two different sites. So we are very confident that the results that we received from this study are going to be very helpful when you choose a sesoma for new plantings. Um, so how did we do this? I'll show you in a minute. So the picture on left top is that uh, New Orleans Public Garden. Uh, you can see the brick wall around that. So that's just one sesuma, and there were sesumas all over the place. So that's just one, I would say one rep right there. One tree with about 24 trees under that, under that one tree. And then you can see the amount of uh, citrus canker on the bottom left picture. You can see the amount of canker on that mature grapefruit tree. And the picture on my right bottom, you see that old uh, open orchard. It's a commercial orchard, uh, and you can see those trees underneath them. And then the picture on the uh, top right is showing you those that inoculum on that grapefruit tree. OK, so we that these two sites, we had abundance of disease, and then we were also uh, kind of analyzing these trees or uh, screening these trees at two different situations where one you have commercial orchard and one you have a, a backyard kind of situation. Uh, disease, this is uh, again materials, how we screen those trees or how we found out which one are more susceptible. So we first one was disease incidence. So disease incidence it, uh, defines as number of disease tree per total trees per cultivar. So uh, to give you an idea, we'll go there after we place those trees, we will go there every week to see which how many trees from a particular cultivar got the disease. So let's say if you have 100 trees, uh, of that cultivar and you got 10 trees during week first, you got the disease, that's your 10% disease incidence. Okay. Uh, with disease severity, we found average number of citrus canker lesions per leaf. Okay, so that's the disease severity. Uh, so maybe week one we had one canker, average number of canker per leaf per leaf. Then week two we had five, week six, we have seven, so those kind of numbers. Uh, and then we also uh, measure the size of the canker lesions. That's very important because uh, if you know the larger the canker, it's going to produce more bacterium inoculum for the secondary infections. OK, same thing with the disease severity is that if you have more more canker lesions on the leaf, your inoculum is going to be greater for the secondary infection. And same thing with the disease. If you have a higher number of trees infested, you will have more inoculum for the secondary season. So those are the three um, data data sets that we collected during those two years. And this is just to give you an example of the disease severity example. So you can say we we on every tree, every single tree, we selected 10 leaves okay, that started getting canker, and we have 15 screening trees per cultivar, and then we had eight cultivars, two sites, two screening. So for this disease severity, we did about close to about 5,000 total leaves. So that's again a very huge set of uh, data. This is just to give you an idea of disease incidence. So these are four four bar graphs. Now these this these graphs were uh, prepared from the data at the end of every growing season. Okay. So New Orleans 2018, New Orleans 2019, Paulina 2018, Paulina 2019. So if you look here, and I'll show you another table. Uh, the first year 2018 we had less disease. Okay. Uh, in 2019, we had more disease, okay, in both sites. Um, so the reason was that to start with 2017, we didn't have enough uh, natural inoculum on the, the trees that we use, okay. But in 2019, 20, uh, 2019, you can see how that shifted. At the end of the season for both years, we had every single one of the trees were infected with canker, 
Okay, so this didn't give us a lot of uh, data, a lot of uh, confidence that uh, is there any difference. So the hypothesis was: is there any difference between the canker susceptibility? So this did not show us any 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 evidence that it has that effect on it because at the end of the season, every single one has the disease. Uh, now, if you won't see uh, Louisiana early in New Orleans in 2019, 2018, because some for some reason, all the trees died and uh, and we couldn't find anything. No root rot. It's just the trees. Trees died uh, for some reason. Uh, when you look at the disease severity, so these are the graphs again, the same graphs, New Orleans 2018, 2019, Paulina 2018, Paulina 2019. So when you look at these graphs and then the lines, you see the, the legend on the top left here. Uh, and this legend is uh, consistent for all those four graphs. OK, so you will if you look at the ruby red, you will see that ruby red is the same kind of orange line everywhere. Um, now, I know this is a little bit confusing, but I just want to give you an idea how the disease progressed from day uh, from week one towards the end of the disease. Now, you will also notice that in 2018 at both sites, we visited those trees every two weeks. Remember, we had four sites to visit in 2018. OK, so that was a reason that you can't go to every site every week. OK. But we didn't include that data in here because there was not a, no no disease on those two sites, but we had to go visit every single tree to find if there's disease or not. So in 2019, when we when we got down to two sites, we decided why don't we do it every week so that we can have more uh, data to see how the disease is progressing every seven to ten days. So you can see you have more data in 2019, but the 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 uh, overall uh, data was kind of very consistent for for all uh, two years for both sides. So I uh, just want to make sure that we don't uh, get confused on the data. So I'm showing you uh, the disease severity data, progress of the disease over time. Um, so if you look, we got about 17, 17 weeks data. Uh, so we started somewhere in uh, July and we went up to like November, something like that. Um, so the the main thing to notice from this graph is you have average number of lesions per leaf, OK, those 4,800 leaves, and then you have the the weeks, the weeks after you the trees were placed under those uh, naturally diseased tree grapefruits. So the most important thing that you want to notice here is that you have the grapefruit up at the top that we know it is highly susceptible, and then you have the kumquat at the base. Ne never got a disease at any of those sites. That was really interesting because in the previous studies, they have shown that those kumquats, they are highly tolerant, so they will get the disease under high disease pressure, but they were not resistant. In our two, uh, two years data, two sites data, full of disease on naturally inoculum, but no disease on kumquat. So that could be the future that we there could be like the breeding program where you can see what kind of gene is making it tolerant or resistant to canker infection. But main thing I want to focus on this one, if you look at the brown slack, Miho, Luciana early, Ovari and St. Anne, they're kind of clustered together. OK, and the brown slack is uh, definitely outlying all those. But again, it, it proves that those those sasumas are somewhat uh, resistant or somewhat or less susceptible to canker as compared to your grapefruit, sweet orange. So this shows one thing that even though we like those uh, type of citrus, grapefruits and the sweet oranges, but maybe in near future, uh, if you are going to plant something uh, citrus related or citrus fruit, then I would recommend choose one of these, uh, choose one of those uh, Satsumas that we that we screen. So this was New Orleans and this is Paulina. Same trend that we saw. Uh, now again, these are two different uh, sites. OK, one is open orchard and one is uh, like a backyard situation where you have a fence of some kind or it's a closed environment. Uh, so in this case, you again see the same thing. 
Uh, sweet orange in this case was highly susceptible grapefruit, so those numbers go up. But kumquat remained the same, uh, uh, no disease whatsoever. Uh, and then your uh, those five satsumas that we selected and we screened, they again clustered together. Um, when you do when you do the when you visualize it biologically, you will see there was a difference. But when you analyze the data in statistic programs, there there is the the overlap with each other. Okay, so there is, that's why it's not showing the um, significance difference. Uh, when we talk about the canker lesion size, this is the New Orleans. Uh, there was no difference for two years, 2018-2019. Uh, well, there was some, so no difference between 2018-2019, but obviously there was some difference. So brown select, miho, and ovari, they had smaller uh, lesion size, okay? Uh, again, I want to uh, emphasize why we did the lesion size is that bigger the lesion, it has the potential to produce a higher, a higher uh, bacterial cells for the second infection. So, from this graph, it shows you that brown select ovary uh, and miho they were kind of like the, uh, they had the smaller size lesion. Uh, at Paulina, uh, for both 2018-2019, there was no difference. And when we looked at the canker lesion size, they were kind of, they were same. Even uh, there were a little biological difference, but statistically there was no difference. Uh, so we're calling them, them uh, now. This data was analyzed because we had the ruby red grapefruit and the Hamblin sweet orange, but we didn't include those 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 trees in our analysis because our goal was to just screen see the difference between the five satsumas so if you include those two sets of data with this the five satsumas you will see a huge statistical diversion that will show you that these were totally different from what we saw because kumquat never got a disease so we took that out of that and we only focused on our five uh, Sasumas. Now, why? What was the reason to include grapefruit and hamlin and seaweed kumquat? Again, we wanted to see that do is there like a, the the disease spread? Okay, because sometimes there could be an escape that trees never got the disease, so we can't analyze. So the, we had to have some positive and negative control, but we didn't include that in here just to see the difference between those five sasumas. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, I know it's uh, uh, numbers there, but these numbers make really good sense. So first I want to focus on brown select and miho. <clears throat> and Louisiana early didn't have any infection because the trees died. So in this case, if you look at brown select and miho in 2018 in New Orleans, okay, you see those two are the smallest lesion size that we see, okay? Miho and brown slack. And same thing that happened in 2019 in New Orleans that we had, those are the two that produces smallest lesion size, okay? So that's one. And remember, well, I said there was a uh, freeze uh, in 2017, winter during 2017 freeze. If you look at the columns now, Okay, New Orleans and New Orleans, if you compare these two columns in 2018 and 2019, you see in 2018 there was less disease, but in 2019 the disease kind of doubled. So this also shows that if you have those source of inoculum, they're not going to go anywhere. They are going to spread more and more disease. So it depends on your initial inoculum to start with. Okay, so from this uh, table, you see that there is difference in the canker lesion size. Now move to Paulina, same trend, okay? Uh, again, uh, comparing brown select and miho, we had those smaller number of size, but somehow ovari and Saint hand again had some smaller number. So we included that ovari in there too, okay? And, and Saint Anne. But when you compare that Saint Anne to rest of them, it was not the lowest uh, number, okay? Lowest lesion size. Uh, again, Paulina, you have those smaller numbers there, okay? Uh, so this overall, when you compare overall, that will show you 
that they have some potential. OK, again, when you look at the Paulina column with Paulina column, you see the disease kind of doubled in uh, 2019 because of the 2018 inoculum. So um, summary for this, this uh, uh, two years research, we found out that Brown select Miho and Owari Sesumant had consistently delayed onset of citrus canker. Because if you look at the disease epidemiology of the citrus canker, uh, everywhere we have seen this disease, it says that uh, it shows that the 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 younger tissue or the when the leaf is still uh, developing, okay, it is highly susceptible compared compared to when the leaf is fully mature and older leaves. So when you see the canker, you might see it on the newly developing leaves. Okay, and in this case, what brown like what we saw on brown like miho and Awari, it delayed that by two to four weeks. Okay. So we had only like 20% of disease incidence, which was delayed. So this also gives you a window of protecting those young developing leaves, maybe with copper as preventative treatment. And by the time uh, the disease pressure is higher, those leaves are already hard enough or those leaves are, are kind of uh, uh, mature and they are already tolerant to the disease, uh, to the onset of the disease. Now, when we talk about disease severity, we just showed you that on an average, brown select and miho had the smallest average number of lesions per, per leaf. Okay, they had only like 1.6 to 1.5 canker lesions. Okay, actual lesions. So again, this shows that. They don't they don't support the bacterium canker as much as the others will support. So naturally there is some kind of tolerance in these two brown select and miho that that had less number of lesions per leaf. When we talk about canker lesion size, we saw that difference in brown select, miho and awari uh, in uh, size in New Orleans. But in Paulina, we didn't see that difference, and that could be because of the environment that we would that were that was uh, created in during those two years. Again, one is uh, uh, kind of like a blocked, fenced, so there is a chance that uh, high humidity uh, could be playing a factor. Whereas the open is kind of like more uh, uh, lim more exposed to the environmental conditions, such as more rain or drought period or less rain or something like that. Um, so the future implications, uh, the paper that we, we is accepted for publication, it is available out there now. OK, you can go to this website if you're interested and you can read more about it. But what we're going to do is we're going to create extension fact sheets. Uh, I have sent that extension fact sheet material to our uh, communication department, so they're going to develop into a really nice uh, extension fact sheet that you can read about. And then we're going to send that to our Citrus Grower Association website, the LouisianaCitrus.org. Uh, I'm also sending it to the Lu Louisiana Nursery and Landscape Association newsletter, so you will see that in the next newsletter. And then we're going to send it through the LSU Ag Center Hard Hint newsletter. And I'm just preparing a story for our media uh, news release, and then we were also going to send it to Louisiana Fruit, Vegetable and Grower Association. But if you don't, if you are not associated with any of these uh, associations, or if you don't get those new newsletter, you can, you are more than welcome to send me an email, and I will be definitely happy to send you that fact sheet. Uh, but I think you, you might be associated to with one or more of these organizations. Uh, in terms of an acknowledgement, I want to acknowledge um, the specialty crop grant uh, program uh, that the, the grant was coordinated by LEAF and I don't think without this support we would have ever done this. Now, uh, let me back up. Uh, if you look in the literature, you won't. This is the first ever study done on Sasumas. Okay. So this is very and this was done under field conditions. So these are the two big achievements that we have during this project. It's the first study to see the difference and then it was done. It was not done in a greenhouse or artificial conditions. This was done under field conditions here in Louisiana. So this study is uh, valid. The results results from this study are very valid and they are, uh, you can incorporate those results into your citrus production. 
Uh, I would like to acknowledge Louisiana Citrus Grower Association for providing letters of support, and and we are very appreciative that we work closely with the industry, and we would like to continue this relationship and collaboration. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, Grower uh, Robert Butch and Renee and Paulina. They let us use their orchard to conduct this study. Uh, they had those uh, grapefruit infected trees uh, that we use and then Amy Graham of Longview Gardens for providing us a second site to compare our work. Uh, we are very appreciative of them. Uh, sometimes even we didn't go there and they were able to able to water our trees uh, and we can't thank enough. Uh, they were very, very, very collaborative and this is again true with uh, I would say all the citrus growers we have here in, in Louisiana that you guys are you guys rock and you guys are very collaboration very uh, with like families now. So with that, I'll take any questions if you have any, uh, but this is my information. Um, you have my cell number if you need me in emergency, uh, but if you email me, that's the best way of contacting me. I check my email. I'm on my phone like a teenager. I'm checking my emails every other minute, so I might not pick up the phone, but I'll check my emails very frequently. So you are more than welcome to either call me or send me an email and uh, look forward to work with you. I'll take any questions now. All right, thank you, Raj. That was fantastic. Um, if you have any questions for Raj, just post them in the Q&A section. Um, we do have one right now, and that is, does the rootstock on satsumas make a difference in their susceptibility? And I assume that's for canker, but maybe for anything. Um, well, we were talking about rootstock when you were uh, uh, showing the video of uh, the new facility. So most of the satsumas that we have here is on trifoliata, citrus trifoliata. Uh, the reason is that because it is highly uh, cold tolerant uh, and then we have the I think the the dragon is the new one that is the dwarf. Uh, so when we talk about now you need to think about the disease um, uh, disease epidemiology or the type of disease we have here. We have a localized disease, a local disease. Citrus canker doesn't go inside like it's not systemic like citrus screening. OK, so that's one reason that we see it on the foliage. We see it on the stems, but it is on, only on the outside. It doesn't affect the xylem vessels or flowing vessels of the of the um, tree. So I don't think rootstock has anything to do with it. Now there are uh, there are some evidence that some of the rootstocks are highly uh, susceptible to your yeah, root rot. In that case, I will be more interested in seeing if like fight off rot, uh, but not with citrus canker. It won't make any difference. OK. Um, we have another question. How was canker eradicated in 1940? Um, they, the, well, I was not there. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't see how they eradicated, but when I look at the literature or did the research on the literature, uh, so I think they did at least 300,000 scouts in 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 in, Orly, uh, in Louisiana, and they they only had about 20 trees that were suspected of canker. So at that time, USDA were testing those, so they were sent to that lab and they were all negative. So uh, before that uh, survey 1940s, what they were doing, they were just removing the trees that had canker, okay? Removing and disposing those trees. Uh, same thing like with Florida. So they started doing that uh, eradication program, uh, but it was not as successful because there is a lot of citrus out there in Florida. Uh, so that was, uh, kind of abandoned in 2007 by USDA because the cost of eradication was way higher than what you will see in the production. So removing the trees and disposing them out properly uh, in the landfill of burning the trees, that was the only option uh, to remove, uh, to eradicate citrus can. Thanks. Uh, we have another question. Do you plan on with Arctic frost satsuma? 
Is that something new? Uh, it's it's a newer variety. I do know that. I can speak to that that people are talking about. Um, obviously, the name suggests it should be more cold tolerant. Yeah, I, we can definitely check it out. We ha still have the sites. All we have to do is get some healthy plants and uh, put them out there and do some research. We can definitely do that if we, if anybody is interested in doing that. Excellent. So maybe something to talk about next year. Yeah, yeah, we definitely can do that. Are there any other questions for Dr. Singh? If not, then thank you so much for um, giving your talk. That was fantastic, really helpful information. Uh, we always really appreciate hearing you uh, and hearing what you have to say. Um, I'm glad we did that. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Raj. So that is going to conclude our the main content for our 2021 LSU Ag Center Citrus Symposium. Before we close it down, we think we might have righted some of the technical difficulties and we're going to try and get you the, the drone video and have that played um, so you could see that. If you have any questions, continue to ask them. Uh, anything that was from any of the presenters throughout the time here um, and we'll see what we can get answered. Uh, with that, you have all of our contact information. Be sure to check the website, louisianacitrus.org. Check lsuagcenter.com for updates on citrus and all things agriculture in Louisiana. And I'd also like to say, make sure you check the Hammond Research Station website because if anything that we do, we publish it there.